He used to be called Citizen 625726. He used to call himself Unbroken. When he left his dystopian city behind, he thought he had found paradise. What he found was uglier and darker than anything he could have imagined. This is his story. This is Inferior. Now available at Amazon, Smashwords, and at StudioBrainstorm.net. Links in the description. Disclaimer. Once again, as with the first KOTOR video game, I am forced to rely upon footage from other channels. This time, though, it's simply because KOTOR 2 was unable to play on my PC, despite my following the vice of several discussion threads on Steam. What? <sighs> okay, fine, fine, I'm cool, I'm fine. So, as before, I provide links to the channels in question in the description. If you like playthrough content, subscribe and support these guys. They make good work. To quote YouTuber Noah Caldwell Gervais in his video essay, Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2 vs. Joseph Campbell, Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords, is just the strangest, most impossible piece of official Star Wars media to ever exist. It would never be released today because the beating heart of the game is heresy. It is heretical to Star Wars because it rejects the monomyth. Not only that, it rejects the entire heroic ideal set down in Hero with a Thousand Faces. The two games exist in a kind of diagonal criticism of one another, the first without guile and the second without mercy. Embracing or excoriating the Star Wars setting, but neither able to definitively prove its vision because of the strengths of the other game." End quote. The only part of this statement that I disagree with is the reasoning why a KOTOR 2 could not be made in today's world that is, circa 2023. A subversive or deconstructionist story like KOTOR 2 wouldn't be made today not because it wouldn't be received well, but because I don't think the people in the modern entertainment industry, film or video game, have the talent to pull it off with any success. Today's entertainment industry seems locked in a weird exaggerated time capsule where it's still the late 20th century, where Explicit sex and violence is still the cutting edge of transgressive content, and their idea of fresh and new is having a main character who isn't a straight white man or have a movie made by someone who isn't a straight white man. There are plenty of online commentators who can articulate this far better than I can, so let's avoid this particular tangent and focus on the subject of this video. The story of Knights of the Old Republic 2 The Sith Lords begins with Obsidian Entertainment, as it was quite literally the first game they ever made. Obsidian Entertainment was founded in 2003 by several developers who formerly belonged to Black Isle Studios, a subsidiary of Interplay Entertainment, a game company that was very much in decline. The founders of Obsidian, Chris Jones, Chris Avalone, Chris Parker, Darren Monahan, and Fergus Urquhart, could quite clearly see this decline and decided that they were better off striking out on their own. At first, though, it looked like they might have made the wrong call. They had plenty of ideas, but Obsidian needed cash. And for the time being, in order to get any of their projects off the ground, they needed to work with other companies. Unfortunately, their attempts to reach out to others like EA, Ubisoft, and Take-Two Interactive came to nothing. But then, so it seemed at the time anyway, Lady Luck finally decided to smile on Obsidian, as in 2003, Simon Jeffries, who was in his last year as president of LucasArts, reached out to the founders of Obsidian for a Star Wars project. He'd originally wanted Bioware to handle the sequel for Knights of the Old Republic, but they had felt the time constraints were too stringent. Luckily, the founders of Bioware knew the founders of Obsidian, as both had worked together back when the latter had worked with Black Isle Studios. And so it was the leaders of Bioware that recommended Obsidian to Simon Jeffries as the people that could make a KOTOR sequel. Of course, let's all get to the part that everybody remembers the most about KOTOR 2's development, 
the fact that it was rushed. Technically, this is true, but also technically kind of not. See, when Obsidian originally agreed to do KOTOR 2, LucasArts gave them a deadline of the 2004 holiday season. However, at some point, for reasons I haven't been able to find, they decided to give KOTOR 2 an extension into 2005, only to then decide to reverse that earlier decision, again, for reasons I haven't been able to find. To their credit, LucasArts did send a lot of its own people to help the guys at Obsidian get the game out on time, but, as we all know, KOTOR 2 was rushed and unpolished when it finally released in late 2004. Complaints of bugs, crashes, and a lot of cut content abounded, despite the fact that the game would receive a lot of critical success and acclaim among Star Wars fans. Chris Avalone, who was lead designer on KOTOR 2, prepared for the project by watching and or reading every piece of Star Wars media he could get his hands on, including the holiday special. Like KOTOR 1, the sequel used the Odyssey engine and would be released on both PC and Xbox. KOTOR 2 would use the same D20 role-playing system that the original game had used, which in turn is based on a system developed by Wizards of the Coast, then owners of Dungeons & Dragons. Unlike its predecessor, KOTOR 2 would have the benefit of a full symphony orchestra, with Mark Griske in the role of composer. The fact that KOTOR 2 is still well thought of today by gamers and Star Wars fans alike is a testament to its strengths. But in many ways, it was that rushed release that marked the beginning of the end for LucasArts. Despite the efforts of subsequent presidents and a few modest successes near the end of the 2000s, like the first Force Unleashed and Republic Commando games, the release of KOTOR 2 marked the end of the halcyon days of LucasArts, leaving Lucasfilm's original game division effectively dead by the time of the Disney buyout. As for Obsidian, while the company has continued on strong in the following decades, barring Fallout New Vegas, the company hasn't really produced a game of significant acclaim since Knights of the Old Republic 2. It's not that subsequent Obsidian games were bad. Fallout New Vegas in particular is considered one of the best entries in that franchise, for example. It's just that apart from those two examples, none of the subsequent games by Obsidian have been nearly as successful or critically acclaimed. I distinctly remember all the hype built up around The Outer Worlds, only for it to be released in 2019 to a resounding verdict of, eh, it's okay. At least for Obsidian's sake, it did do well enough to warrant a sequel. Without further ado, this is Knights of the Old Republic, The Sith Lords. Like the previous game, the story begins in classic movie fashion. The title crawl informs us that despite the defeat of Darth Malak and the death of the Starforge at Rakata Prime, the Sith have managed to rally, the Republic is crippled, and the Jedi Order is all but extinct. It would seem that KOTOR 1's triumphant ending was little more than a reprieve. After a brief cutscene showing the Ebon Hawk crippled and adrift in space, there is a brief optional tutorial level where the player takes over T3M4, who tries to repair the ship enough so that it can coast into a landing at the Paragus mining station. KOTOR 2 places a greater emphasis on the use of companion characters outside of combat scenarios than the first game did. In the previous game, the only instance where you essentially controlled a companion character in the absence of the player character was in the brief scene aboard the Leviathan. Apart from T3, there is another astromech droid that you can reactivate to help, two heavily damaged HK droids, including HK-47, and two humans, an old woman who seems to be dead, and a young woman who is barely clinging to life. Thus, we are introduced to the protagonist known only as the Jedi Exile. She wouldn't receive the name of Mitra Surik until Star Wars The Old Republic MMO came out. Well, that's one way to wake up. After a bit of searching and scrounging, and alas, finding no fresh clothes to wear, the Exile discovers the source of the mysterious voice that woke her up. 
It turns out that the old woman from the Ebon Hawk is very much alive, and her name is Crea, voiced by Sarah Kestelman. Kestelman is an English actress mostly known for theater and television work. Knights of the Old Republic 2 is only one of two video games she ever voice acted for, the other being 2005's Shattered Union. But for my money, the most interesting detail about her career was that her first film role was in the infamously weird and bizarre and frankly downright bad 1970s film Zardoz. Considering the infamous train wreck that movie is, it's kind of amazing that she did even five more movie roles after that. The first conversation of the game is pretty interesting in how it very quickly highlights one of the major differences between this and KOTOR 1. Namely, that because of his amnesiac status prior to the revelation aboard the Leviathan in the first game, Revan is very much a blank slate. He does have a past and a history beyond being a servant of the Republic, but he just doesn't know that until the Leviathan. By contrast, the first conversation between the Exile and Kreia establishes that the Exile does have a past, and she's very much aware of it. For, at the moment, vague reasons connected to the Mandalorian Wars, as her moniker implies, she was exiled from the Jedi Order and apparently was stripped of her Force sensitivity. But it would seem that, unlike what Nomi Sunrider did to Ulic Keldroma in Tales of the Jedi, it didn't quite stick. And in part thanks to the mental contact between her and Kreia, she is beginning to regain her connection to the Force. But for now, the priority is to get off the station. After a little searching and fighting off some unusually hostile mining droids, the Exile discovers that she and Kreia aren't the only living beings on the station. There is another. Are you an angel? Ah, oh, I'm just kidding. That's the worst line I've ever used. Hope some poor kid doesn't start using it. Wow, Obsidian. I don't think they heard that fourth wall break in Taipei. This charming ladies man is Atten Rand, voiced by Nikki Cat. Couldn't find much about the actor except that he's mostly been typecast as various unsympathetic characters. And if Atten Rand is any indication thus far, he seems to be playing to type. But again, shelve that for later. With Rand's help, the Exile manages to reconnect with T3, and with some help from the Astromech, she manages to find some answers, as well as a set of clothes. Admittedly, most of the mystery is quickly resolved when she encounters an HK-50 model assassin droid, who talks a little too much for his own good and apparently was not programmed with much in the way of cunning. Frankly, this new model feels like a step back, reminding me all too much of that dim-witted HK-24 series droid from the Knights of the Old Republic prequel comic. Clarification. Yes, Master. No doubt the flurry of destruction on board the Harbinger somehow drugged you into a stupor from which you could not awaken. Most curious. Placation. Merely a turn of phrase, Master. The implication that your state was due to the result of ingesting large quantities of Juma juice was unintentional. I meant to communicate only that you were somehow rendered unconscious before you were locked securely in the cargo hold. Clarification by locked. I meant sealed, Master. My vocabulator seems to be malfunctioning. I can't wait to see this droid dismantled. He is too incompetent to be left functioning. And HK-47 would agree with me on that. But incompetent assassin droids prove to be the least of the Exile's concerns. As the Republic cruiser the Harbinger rolls into town, and if the ship's seeming lone occupant is anything to go by, the chances of survival have gone from slim to almost none. This, friends, is Darth Sion, and just from that cutscene alone, he makes Malak look like a pussycat. 
Of course, the animation and the models look a little dated by today's standards, but for me, it's Mark Grisky's soundtrack that really sells the creeping menace of this particular man. He looks like gray clay that cracked in the kiln, he's surrounded by dead bodies, and he literally is the scariest thing in the game so far just by kneeling there, menacingly. Eventually, the Exile manages to reunite with Kreia and Rand, dispatch that worthless HK-50, and initially planned to escape via the Republic cruiser that just docked, but given the dark side presence that permeates the entire ship, they instead decide to go for the Ebon Hawk back in the Paragus Station hangar. But first, they have to steal the astrogation charts from the Harbinger's Nava computer, otherwise they'll never make it out of the asteroid field alive. Turns out the Harbinger's bridge was just down the hall and to the right. Kind of anticlimactic. But it is made up for by listening in on several recordings made by the former crew of the Harbinger, which helps us piece together exactly what happened here. Originally, the Exile was being transported by the Harbinger to Telos IV under the orders of now Admiral Cartho Nassi. The Exile was unconscious for most of the journey, under the supervision of HK-50, who, it's now pretty clear, was intending to sell her to the criminal network known as the Exchange for a rich bounty. Jedi are very valuable these days to the criminal underworld. The Harbinger diverted from its course when it received a distress signal and found a freighter, the Ebon Hawk, being attacked by the Sith. Aboard the Ebon Hawk, they found only Kreia's seemingly dead body and T3, while aboard the Sith warship, they only found one seemingly dead man, Darth Sion, and a bunch of stealth assassins that they didn't know about but snuck aboard the Harbinger from the Sith warship anyway. Eventually, Sion revived and along with the Sith Assassins began systematically wiping out the Harbinger's crew. Luckily for the Exile, Kreia revived as well and managed to get her and her caretaker, HK-50, aboard the Ebon Hawk. Of course, the Sith, now in control of the Harbinger, pursued and damaged the ship, which is how it ended up at Paragus Station in the first place. The Exile, Kreia, and Rand begin sneaking back aboard Paragus Station through the Harbinger's fueling tubes, but are quickly discovered by Darth Sion. Kreia stays behind to try and delay the Sith Lord, and it does not go well for her. It's at this point we discover that the Exile has a strong force bond with Kreia now, similar to that between Revan and Bastila in the previous game, only this one is strong enough that when Kreia loses her hand, the Exile feels the pain of dismemberment. Of course, mystery continues to pile on top of mystery, as it's pretty clear that Kreia and Sion have a history. But of course, we have no idea what kind of history that is as yet. She does somehow manage to escape and rejoin our heroes along with T3, and the quartet manage to make it to the Ebon Hawk and escape by blowing up the Paragus asteroid field. Well, now that we just killed a planet, maybe one of you can tell me what's going on. Because between assassin droids, a Sith Lord that looks like he sleeps with vibroblades, and being target practice for a Republic warship, I was better off in my cell. Huh. A genuinely understandable reaction. There might be hope for him yet. Repaired this ship, my eye. Next thing you know, it's gonna claim credit for saving our skins. If that little noisemaker says it repaired the ship once, then it can prove it by doing it again. Go on, get! I take that back. Go fuck yourself, Rand. All that aside, the picture that Kreia paints of the situation in the galaxy is a very grim one. As most of us are familiar with by now, the Jedi Civil War resulted in a lot of Jedi dying, a lot of Jedi going over to the Sith, but what we didn't know until this point, according to Kreia, is that it also caused a lot of disillusionment. Many Jedi, especially the young, blamed the failings of the teachings of the Jedi Order and of the Council for causing Revan and Malak to fall to the dark side in the first place. As such, they've essentially forsaken the Jedi Order and its ways. Meanwhile, the Sith have rallied and managed to reorganize under new leadership. But this time, their goal is not galactic conquest, as Malak envisioned, but rather the extermination of the Jedi. Maybe Galactic Conquest after that. Meanwhile, there is the matter of the Force Bond between Kreia and the Exile. On the downside, if one suffers pain, the other will feel it as well, which is why the Exile reacted to Kreia having her hand cut off. 
There is also the likelihood that if one should die, the force bond will cause the other to die as well. On the plus side, the force bond allows easy telepathic communication between the two and will allow them to strengthen one another in battle. For now, it seems Kreia is willing to help the Exile re-establish her connection with the Force and regain her powers. After all, to stop the Sith, they're going to need every advantage they can get. Goodbye, Paragus. Hello, Telos. And immediately, the crew are introduced to one of KOTOR 2's overriding themes. Actions actually have consequences. Firstly, they are detained by Telos security forces, led by Lieutenant Dahl Gren, voiced by Charles Dennis, who voiced crime lord Davik Kang in KOTOR 1, and even has a similar character model to him. The detention is because the crew of the Ebon Hawk is under suspicion for possibly being involved in the destruction of the Paragus asteroid belt. Secondly, remember how Telos was Karth Onassi's homeworld in the first game and that it was bombed almost to oblivion by Admiral Karath who was working for Darth Malak at the time? Well, it turns out there's a concerted restoration effort led by the Republic on Telos, and a lot of the material they were using in that restoration came from the Paragus mining station, which is now nothing more than space dust. Yeah. Now, depending on player choice, previously the asteroid belt was either destroyed directly by you or by Darth Sion as he pursued you in the Harbinger. Either way, it's just as well that so far there are only suspicions and no confirmation that the Ebon Hawk was directly involved. Otherwise, the crew of the Ebon Hawk would all be thrown in a jail cell permanently and we wouldn't have a story. To his credit, Lieutenant Gren is a reasonable guy for the most part. Even though the Ebon Hawk's crew are suspects, his attitude towards them is not hostile, merely professional. For the time being, the Ebon Hawk and T3 are confiscated while the Exile, Rand, and Kreia are kept in force fields. There's this weird bit where an assassin from the Exchange busts in and tries to claim the bounty on the Exile. Apparently, he's clever enough to pose as a TSF officer, even taking the place of a guy who is currently on leave, only he's then dumb enough to deactivate the force fields to kill them rather than just rig them to explode. And there's no instance of the Exile or Kreia using the force to manipulate him into doing this. Pretty bizarre and nonsensical, if you ask me. Of course, it's a pretty awkward scene when the TSF officers, the real ones, I mean, bust in to find a dead guy in their uniform and three prisoners loosed from their cells. Luckily, level-headedness prevails, and Lieutenant Gren immediately recognizes that this bounty hunter isn't the guy he's claiming to be. So our heroes avoid any further trouble. In fact, they even get moved to cushy apartments. They're still under house arrest and have no access to T3 or the Ebon Hawk, but it's an upgrade at least. Before I can continue the story, I have to point out this funny moment where KOTOR 2 decides to take a direct shot at KOTOR 1. In the first game, you could just pick up loot wherever, but here, the first time you try to loot in a room where someone is there, they'll basically call you out on it and have you get out. So you're limited to only looting unoccupied rooms on Citadel Station. On a less amusing note, the Ebon Hawk is stolen shortly thereafter by a mysterious figure in white. Telos security forces have no idea how it was done or how they managed to alter the records to conceal the theft. Anyway, the plot proper gets going again, kind of, when the Exile and Co. are approached by a herd of Ithorians led by one Chodo Habat. Ithorians, being experts in biotechnology and environmental restoration, they've been contracted by the authorities at Telos to help restore the planet after its near destruction during the Jedi Civil War. Unfortunately, the restoration efforts have run into some serious problems. Besides the loss of resources from Paragus, the ever-slimy and ubiquitous Zerka Corporation from the previous game has been muscling in on the restoration project. It turns out there are a lot of abandoned industrial and military facilities that are still there on the surface of Telos. And as part of a separate deal worked out with the Republic, Zerka Corp is permitted to use those facilities, ostensibly to help with the restoration project, in reality so that Zerka Corp can use the restoration project as a way of selling its products to new markets. There's also the fact that an important infrastructure droid that Chodo was using to help plan out the restoration project has gone missing, and he's in need of a replacement. And that's not including the fact that the criminal syndicate, The Exchange, continues to make trouble for everyone aboard Citadel Station, including them. 
partly because they are in an alliance with Zerka Corporation, and partly because they want to entrench their own criminal syndicate onto the restored world. Being mildly Force-sensitive himself, Chodo sensed the Exile's presence within the Force, which he describes as something akin to a wound. He's hoping that maybe she can succeed where Telosian officialdom has failed expose the corruption of both Zerka and the Exchange, and thus stop them from interfering with the Athorian's restoration work. In exchange, among other things, he offers to use his mild force sensitivity to try and begin healing the wound inside of the Exile. Bringing down Zerka Corp and its Mirialan local executive, Jana Lorso, is a bit convoluted and at first feels kind of like busy work. The Exile and Co. stop a group of thugs hired by Zerka to steal another infrastructure droid the Athorians have brought in. A blaster with, by Telos standards, illegal modifications is found on one of them, which leads to a guy whom you can persuade to testify against Zerka to the Telosian government. But to really handicap Zerka and its exchange allies, first the Exile has to get to the local exchange branch leader, a Quarren by the name of Lopak Slusk. There are many, many ways of resolving this particular issue. But canonically, while visiting the local cantina on the Citadel, the Exile is approached by Slusk's second-in-command, a Zeltron named Luxa, who very much wants to take her boss's place. She promises the Exile that she will make sure that security guarding Lopak Slusk is light today, giving the heroes an easier route to the Quarren crime lord. Of course, Luxa quickly ends up dead for her trouble when she tries to double-cross the Exile as well as eliminate Slusk, and in exchange for sparing the Quarian, the Exile forces him to leave the Athorians alone. But the final nail in Zerka's coffin comes from a little bit of skullduggery and subterfuge. In exchange for paying off a debt that a Duros droid repairman owes the Exchange, the Exile acquires his credentials, which she then uses to lure away Zerka Corporation's administrative assistant droid, B4-D4. Chodo then has the droid reprogrammed so that he can lie and deceive, and then the player takes control of B4 as he goes into Zerka's office to steal some very incriminating data. There's this genuinely funny bit where B4 manipulates the astromech droid guarding the information database, T1N1, into attacking the Zerka employees, giving him the cover he needs to extract the data, as well as erase all records of his ownership. Evidently, along with the ability to lie, B4 has acquired a taste for freedom. In fact, after he returns with the data and is sent on his way, you can encounter him and T1 waiting at the spaceport to depart for Nashada as free droids. A sensible move given that Janna would happily scrap the two of them once she figured out what's going on. There is a brief scare when Zerka retaliates by sending a bunch of thugs to kill the Athorians, but our heroes are able to intervene just in time, and force powers or no, the Exile and her friends are more than a match for them. As promised in exchange, Chodo partially heals the wound in the Force that the Exile carries within her, and even gifts her a lightsaber component as well as access to a shuttle that will take them out into the hinterlands of Telos. If the stolen Ebon Hawk is to be found and recovered, it will be out there, the Athorian thinks. Chodo also promises that they will find help out there in the form of an ally of theirs, a Zabrak named Beodur. Here I have to bring up my first major criticism of KOTOR 2. And you'll be surprised to hear this isn't something that is related to the fact that the game was rushed, because it appears consistently throughout the game's storyline. KOTOR 2 is often famed for its grey morality, for being one of the first Star Wars properties, or at least the first major Star Wars property, to blur the classic black and white, light versus dark side binary of previous Star Wars entries. Thing is, I'm not seeing that. Kreia can say that Chodo Habat is using the Exile for his own agenda, but as far as can be determined, the Athorians are basically hammer-headed little angels, not a single evil bone in their bodies. Meanwhile, the Zerka people are the same slimy corporate scumbags that they were in the previous game. It's a situation devoid of the kind of nuance that is required for grey morality. This is also seen in how KOTOR 2's gameplay affects the story. Kreia, in her capacity as mentor to the Exile, makes it pretty clear from the get-go and in subsequent interactions 
that she rejects the categorizations of Jedi and Sith, light side and dark side. But the only way for the player character to become stronger and gain more abilities is to lean hard into either the light side or the dark side of the moral binary. So the gameplay is actually working against both the tone and the themes of the story that Knights of the Old Republic 2 is trying to tell. Of course, because Zerka is always up to no good and because we need dramatic tension, things go wrong immediately when the shuttle is shot down by a Zerka air defense turret. Luckily, the crew is mostly unscathed and are found by Beodur, voiced by Roger Smith, an actor and writer who's mostly known for working with Spike Lee. Beodur is a soft-spoken mechanical genius with a really weird, really cool cyborg energy arm, a little droid companion, and apparently knows the Exile back from the Mandalorian Wars, referring to her as the General. For the most part, he doesn't like thinking about the Mandalorian Wars, which of course conveniently skirts around the idea that maybe we could reveal more about the Exile's origins earlier than the story would like us to find out. Beodur was out here helping the Ithorian Restoration Project by maintaining a system of energy shields cordoning off certain sections of Telos, allowing its biosphere to recover naturally. And he is more than willing to help our heroes deal with the dirty, slimy Zerka Corporation people that have been screwing with his and the Ithorian's efforts to help the planet. Here I must pause the story a bit to talk about the overall atmosphere and tone of the game. As is fairly common knowledge at this point, especially among Star Wars gamers, Knights of the Old Republic 2 is deliberately darker than the previous one. For me, in many ways, it is the surface of Telos, not Paragus or the Citadel Station, that really drives that home. The previous two were urban environments. Certainly, they were gloomier looking than, say, the upper city of Taris from KOTOR 1, but especially when you think of environments like the lower city and undercity of that same world, the difference isn't quite as noticeable. It's when you get to the surface of Telos, at least for me, where the game really starts to make the impression that, no, this is a much darker and more somber story than its predecessor. Telos is a dead world that the Republic is desperately trying to resuscitate. And everything from the cloudy skies to the washed out color palette really brings that home. Sometimes the game does overplay this a little bit, but that's later on, so I'll save that criticism for when it becomes relevant. Eventually, after sneaking past or fighting their way through assorted mercenaries and ugly bug-eyed monsters, our merry band reaches an abandoned Republic military base. Once inside, Bayo demonstrates, in his own words, The Zerka mercenaries were a little surprised when I broke my way out of my holding cell. The shields there were even weaker than these, after you. More than a little nonsensical? Certainly. But this is the universe where sci-fi space wizards are somehow able to deflect bolts of energy moving at the speed of light with laser swords. In that context, a guy with a prosthetic arm that's half energy beam taking out force fields by punching them isn't nearly as outlandish as it should be. Turns out the facility's security droids have somehow been activated and taken care of the Zerka mercenaries for our heroes. Unfortunately, it also means that they have to make scrap metal out of them as well. But luckily, Beodur still has access to the shield network, and he's able to determine the most likely place where the Ebon Hawk might be. He finds a seemingly innocuous anomaly overlooked by the TSF. A tiny, isolated part of Telos's polar region that seems to be drawing power from the shield network. Small and subtle enough to be overlooked by anyone without Beodur's subtle grasp of the shield network. Once the security droids are all taken care of, and the last surviving Zerka mercenary is safely escorted outside, because of course, light side playthrough is canon, the Exile and co. take another shuttle off towards the polar region, only to be shot down again this time by yet another HK-50 droid. The Exchange really wants that Jedi bounty, and is prepared to throw as many assassin droids at the Exile as possible to get it. It's three assassin droids this time, but once again they display the same combination of arrogance and incompetence as the one on Paragus, which kind of makes it hard for me to take them as a serious threat. The Exile and her friends dispatching them is more akin to swatting an irksome fly at this point. 
They find the entrance to the mysterious facility hidden inside the Polar Mesa and find the welcoming committee is certainly less than welcoming. While her companions are detained by a bunch of women in white known as the Handmaidens, the exile is brought before Jedi Master Atris, former member of the Jedi Council, and specifically one of those responsible for exiling her from the Order in the first place. She's voiced by Elizabeth Ryder, a woman with a pretty extensive career in television. Unfortunately, they were all British shows, and I'm an American, so I don't recognize a single one of the stuff she's been in. Like her Amazonian bodyguards, she too goes for the all-white ensemble. And as one might expect from someone with an aesthetic that clearly screams officious moral purity, Ryder gives one of the best voice performances in the game by portraying Atris with exactly the kind of cold, judgmental pomposity that such a character calls for. KOTOR 2 offers a lot of dialogue options in this encounter providing a lot of variant ways for which the Exile can respond to Atris's questions and accusations. It really highlights some of the inherent strengths of this older style of silent blank slate protagonists in RPGs, despite a lot of so-called experts claiming that such tropes are outdated and passé. Regardless of variety, the confrontation between Atris and the Exile establishes the following. One, the destruction of the Paragus mining facility has even worse ramifications than first thought. Namely, that without the fuel supplied from Paragus, Citadel Station will not be able to maintain orbit and may eventually crash into Telos itself. Second, the restoration of Telos is important because it will help convince the Republic that it can be done. If it fails, they'll simply give up the attempt and countless worlds devastated by the Sith will be left unrecoverable. Third, it's clear that though she tries to conceal it, Atris really, really does not like the Exile. And while she claims the position of righteous indignation at the Exile for defying the Council's authority and joining Revan in the fight against the Mandalorians, the way certain accusations are phrased suggests that there's more than a little personal hatred here. The fact that Atris possesses the Exile's former lightsaber proves further evidence of this odd, hostile fixation with her. And that's kind of the key thing. Jedi aren't supposed to hate, after all. That is a surefire way to the dark side. Of course, if you, as the Exile, try to call Atris out on this, she will angrily deny this and simply accuse the Exile of being blinded by hate, in an obvious case of projection. The implications are more than a little menacing, and kind of like that Rakata computer program on Kashyyyk in the previous game, kinda threatens to spoil one of KOTOR 2's big twists later on. Finally, despite the bad blood between these two women, when informed about the existence of the Sith and their hunt for the remaining Jedi, Atris is willing to concede that it might be beneficial to work with the Exile, if only for the sake of survival. And so at last, our heroine and her friends have their overarching objective for this game. Just like Revan's search for the star maps in KOTOR 1, the Exile's job is to seek out those Jedi Masters who yet live and convince them to once again take up arms against the Sith. Atris suggests Dantooine and the old Jedi Academy there as the rendezvous point. But before we set out on our grand search, a few interesting details. First, there is the matter of the Handmaidens. They are all voiced by Grey Delisle, for once not being typecast as the malicious evil female antagonist. Secondly, a bit of questioning from the Exile reveals that they are human Achani hybrids. The Achani are a near-human species whose noteworthy characteristics are their white hair and eyes, and an odd little quirk of their genetics where siblings tend to look almost identical, even if they're not twins. Now, one could make the argument that this is simply Obsidian cutting costs so that they only need to use the one character model for this. But hey, it's hardly the most ridiculous reason for a bit of Star Wars lore. After all, there are Aqualish with fins and Aqualish with hands. Solely because of a blooper where Pondababa has two different hands in two different parts of the Mos Eisley Cantina scene. Third and finally, while the rest of the Handmaidens are just as cold, distant, and arrogant as their mistress, one of them seems unusually interested in the Exile and asks her about the Force. 
For some mysterious reason, the Handmaidens were all selected to be the protectors of the Jedi, even though they are not Force-sensitive, and indeed, Atris seems to be the only one on Telos. Alas, that's all there is to it in this kind of playthrough. The nice handmaiden, in reality her name is Brianna, will only join the player's crew if you play as a male exile. Luckily, there is a mod that allows you to get around this particular restriction, so that you can add Brianna to the team, as well as the character that you would normally only have access to playing as a female exile. And so, when the exile departs from Telos, she will sneak aboard the Ebon Hawk and join the crew, mostly to serve as Atris's eyes and ears. The second detail worth noting is that before the Exile is brought in to speak with Atris, there is a brief cutscene showing the rest of the crew, apart from T3 of course, and while Beodur is unconscious from the crash still, Kreia decides to do a little digging inside of Atanran's mind and discovers that there is a secret that he desperately doesn't want anyone, least of all the Exile, to know about. A very dark and terrible secret. The only thing that's preventing Kreia from spilling the beans, as it were, is that she thinks that, in his own perverse way, Rand might be useful to the Exile, and thereby to her own plans. The final detail before departing Telos is the recovery of T3, who was kept in a separate chamber. It would seem that Atris has had her people download a copy of T3's entire memory, for what purpose no one can say. Luckily, this particular data mining was a two-way street, and T3 was able to extract some information from the Hidden Academy archives of his own, namely a recording of the Exile's trial by the Jedi Council, the day they exiled her. Do you know why we have called you here? As Revan summoned you, so have you come full circle to return to the Jedi. Why did you defy us? The Jedi are guardians of the peace, and have been for centuries. This call to war undermines all that we have worked for. Is Revan your master now? Or is it the horror you wrought at Malachor that has caused you to see the truth at last? You refuse to hear us. You have shut us out, and so have shut yourself to the galaxy. We feel that your true understanding of what happened at Malachor V will only happen in time, and it cannot happen here, near the battlegrounds where you fought. You are exiled, and you are a Jedi no longer. There is one last thing. Your lightsaber. Surrender it to us. <laughs> Much defiance in that one. You were correct, Kavar. When she was here, I felt it. It was as if she was not there, more like an echo. Revan's influence has grown amongst the youngest of the Order. He speaks to their passions, not their sense. The war has touched them. Many of them have found themselves in the war against the Mandalorians. It is as I feared, and I fear that we have played into the hands of the enemy. We have not lost a Jedi this day. You felt it. She has lost herself. She is no Jedi. She walked Revan's path, but she was not strong enough. I fear it is our teachings that may have led Revan to choose the path he did. We are not the ones who taught him. We take responsibility, Atris, not cast blame. The choice of one was the choice of us all. Revan's teacher intended no harm, and Revan had many teachers since. Yet they all stem from the same source. Her teachings violated the Jedi Code and lead all who listen to the dark side, as they did the Exile. You are wrong. The dark side is not what I sensed in the Exile. Surely the rest of you felt it as well. That emptiness we felt. She has changed. Whatever that wound was, it was of the dark side. We should not have let her depart. She will simply join Revan again, or perhaps worse. What would you have done with her, Atris? Be mindful of your feelings. This is not Revan who stood before you. This one walks a different path. No, although that may come in time. We let her go because we must, 
Where she travels, she carries her destination with her. Malachor V should have been her grave. You saw it in her walk, and in the Force. It was as if she was already dead. No, not death. Many battles remain for that one, if what we have seen is true. But the future is a shifting thing, and she cuts like a blade through it. We should have told her the truth. A Jedi deserved to know. No good would have come from it, even if what you believe was true. There is still the matter of Revan, and such truths could leave us vulnerable on two fronts. Perhaps in many years we will call her before us and explain what happened to her, and how she may be healed. Until then, she must accept her journey. But she may never discover the truth, and she will never know why we cast her out. Then that is the future we must accept. From this, the crew of the Ebon Hawk now knows which Jedi to look for and where they might be found. Vruk Lamar, still voiced by Ed Asner like in KOTOR 1 on Dantooine, Zez Kai L, voiced by Billy Brown, mostly known for being Mike Anderson from Dexter and August Marks from Sons of Anarchy, who can be found on Narshada, the Smuggler's Moon, Kavar, voiced by Tom Kane, who played both Vandar Tokar and Uthar Wynn in KOTOR 1 and can be found on Onderon, and Lana Vash, who can be found on Korriban. I could not for the life of me find the name of her voice actress. At any rate, our heroes have a mission, and, although they don't know it yet, a pursuer, as we are introduced by a cutscene to the other famous Sith Lord of this video game, Darth Nihilus, and his extremely reluctant apprentice, Vice S. Mar, voiced by Kelly Hu. She's been in all kinds of movie and television roles, from The Scorpion King to CSI New York to Phineas and Ferb to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2012. These days, she mostly does voiceover work for Disney cartoons. Depending on how the current strikes are going on at the time of this recording, we'll see for how much longer. As to the characters of Nihilus and Mar, we'll get to that in due course. For now, off to Dantooine. Since this is one of the planets that was also featured in KOTOR 1, it actually was kind of a surprise to see how much the planet had changed in this particular game. In KOTOR 1, Dantooine gave off a sense of serenity and relative peace in a galaxy at war. In part thanks to the relaxed and calm atmosphere of the Jedi Temple, but also because of how nice it looked, perpetually bathed in the golden light of afternoon. In KOTOR 2, it has the same decayed feeling as the surface of Telos. The skies are overcast and everything is much grayer, so that the golden savannah-esque plains now look like an ugly beige. On the one hand, this is appropriate as it fits the overall far more somber tone of KOTOR 2. On the other hand, though, it does make it look a little too similar to the surface of Telos. They're not indistinguishable by any means, but they don't stand out from one another nearly as much as I feel they ought to. Snicker all you like at the whole single biome planet trope, but there is a reason why George Lucas did this in both the trilogies he directed and why KOTOR 1 emulated this. If for no other reason, it makes it easier to know where you are in the story and in the galaxy so that you never really lose track of anything. Planets with radically different settings also make the universe look more appealing and fun. But in fairness, fun isn't exactly what KOTOR 2 is aiming for. Lest we forget, as was mentioned back in KOTOR 1, Dantooine was devastated by a direct attack led by Malak. And KOTOR 2 The Sith Lords takes place roughly five standard years after the events of KOTOR 1, so obviously the world is still trying to recover from that devastation. The original inhabitants and farmers of Dantooine are struggling to rebuild their lives, all the while having to deal with hordes of salvagers that have come to loot the remains of the Jedi Temple and any other bits of civilization on Dantooine, as well as mercenary bands causing all kinds of trouble for them. The Jedi Civil War, and in particular Malak's attack on the Enclave, has also left the populace embittered towards Jedi as a whole. To their way of thinking, there isn't that much distinction between a Jedi and a Sith. They are both people with weird psychic powers and wield lightsabers, it's just that Revan and Malak happen to be bad guys, and in fact they used to be Jedi before they fell. So there's not exactly a lot of help forthcoming in the Exile's cause of finding Master Vruk Lamar. Luckily, at Kunda, the main surviving settlement on Dantooine, the Exile finally finds someone who might have a lead on the missing Jedi Master. Tarina Adari, former Agricultural Administrator of Dantooine, now for all intents and purposes the leader of Kunda. 
and thereby the closest thing that Dantooine as a whole has to a leader. Now, based out of the Matali estate, which once belonged to a significant minor character from KOTOR 1, Adari is practically the only one left on Dantooine with anything resembling positive sentiments for the Jedi in general and for Master Vruk Lamar in particular, as she's been in secret contact with him for some time now. However, the Jedi Master has unfortunately gone missing lately, and the Administrator hasn't a clue as to what may have happened to him. What with all the salvagers and the mercenaries causing trouble for her people, she's not exactly in a great position to start up a manhunt for a missing Jedi. With nothing better to go on, the Exile leads her team towards the Old Jedi Enclave in the hopes that maybe they'll find some clues there. Both to where Master Lamar might be, but also to where this new Sith menace may have come from and what happened to the Jedi more generally. Maybe there will even be some clues that will help the Exile regain more of her connection to the Force. Not to mention the materials that she will need to make a lightsaber of her own now that Atris has her old one, and isn't planning on giving it back anytime soon. After saving some poor sap who locked himself in a rune to avoid getting slaughtered by Legrex, things that look like the unholy union of a dinosaur and a praying mantis, our heroes come up empty on clues as to where Vruk Lamar might be. They do get a bit of slight compensation, though, in the form of a new teammate, Michael the Disciple, a scholar and historian in the pay of the Republic who is also trying to uncover the mysteries of what exactly happened to the Jedi Order following the Civil War. He readily agrees to accompany the Exile, suggesting that like Beodur, he knows her from the past. Just as Brianna the Handmaiden will only join the Exile's party if you play the Exile as a man, Michael only joins the party if you play the Exile as a woman. At last, however, our heroes do find clues that eventually lead them to the missing Master Lamar. In a series of caves riddled with Kinrath, our heroes discover a patch of crystals, some of which seem unusually attuned to the Force signature, such as it is, of the Exile herself. Excellent material for a lightsaber focusing crystal. After some more exploring of said cave, they finally find Master Lamar, a prisoner of mercenaries in the employ of the Exchange Criminal Syndicate. Our heroes dispatch the mercenaries with ease, only to find that Master Lamar is none too happy to see them. Always rushing into action without thinking of the consequences. What? You're expecting thanks? Once again, KOTOR 2 is determined to hit the exile over the head with the consequences stick. Vruk Lamar deliberately allowed himself to be captured by the mercenaries so that he could figure out what their plans are. That plan being ultimately to attack the Kunda settlement and kill Administrator Adari, allowing the exchange to essentially take over Dantooine and use its remote location as a base from which to extend their criminal enterprise. Bounties on Jedi being what they are these days, the mercenaries had also been hoping to sell Lamar to the exchange on Narshada for some extra profit. And in fact, the player does have the option to leave Lamar in their hands and allow them to do just that. Anyway, it won't take long for the mercs to realize that their extra golden goose has flown the coop. Lamar is convinced that they will accelerate their plans and attack Kunda a lot sooner than they'd initially intended. Once again, innocent lives are impacted by the exile's recklessness. At least that's how Master Lamar sees it. In this and later conversations, you do have the opportunity to debate the issue of the Mandalorian Wars with him, whether or not it was right to follow Revan to war, given what Revan and Malak did after the Mandalorians were defeated. And give the Obsidian crew their credit, because it is genuinely hard to decide who exactly has the right of it. Obviously, there was no way of knowing that Revan and Malak would fall when they decided to help the Republic in defiance of the Council, whose inaction was contributing to the deaths of millions. After all, in Star Wars, even with those who have precognitive abilities, the future is always in motion. On the other hand, given that this actually is what happened, the Jedi Council, with the benefit of damning hindsight, can point and say, See, we were right all along. This was a mistake. Deaths at the hands of the Mandalorians were averted, only for other millions to be killed as a result of the Jedi Civil War. Lamar heads back to Kunda by his own route, and the Exile and co. end up running into Azkul, the leader of the mercenaries on Dantooine and he makes an offer to the Exile to side with him in destroying Kunda, essentially offering the dark side choice. 
Should you take him up on this offer, you end up fighting and killing Master Lamar in combat. There's also an option that even if you refuse now, later during the mercenary attack you can betray Kunda and allow Azkul to kill Administrator Adari. Lamar will be occupied elsewhere in the fighting and never realize your treachery, and thus remain an albeit wary ally. But of course the light side canon version is where the exile turns Azkul down flat and ends up killing him along with most of his mercs in the inevitable fight when they try to assault Kunda. Lamar still has his doubts regarding the exile, but his opinion of her has improved enough that he is willing to give her a lesson in certain lightsaber techniques, boosting her defensive abilities. He also agrees to attend the meeting of the surviving Jedi Masters, assuming they can still be found. Although Lamar learns from the Exile for the first time that the enemy they face is in fact the Sith, he and the surviving Masters were well aware that some mysterious enemy was hunting the Jedi down, mainly by tracking them through the Force, hence why the Masters all separated and went to different worlds. Too many Jedi in one place made it easier for them to be found and destroyed. He also reveals that the loss of the Exile's connection to the Force was not the doing of the Jedi Council, but a consequence of the Mandalorian Wars, though of course, he doesn't elaborate on this. And I must reiterate that in this scenario, like on Telos, there is no gray morality here. Your choice is between either helping the scumbag mercenaries or the poor innocent put-upon farmers who are just trying to rebuild their lives. Contrast that with the Sunri murder trial from Manan in KOTOR 1 where Sunri was indeed the victim of a Sith plot to discredit the Republic, but did in fact commit the murder of which he is accused. Revealing the truth of Sunri's guilt is scoring a political point for the Sith, whereas helping the Republic would mean burying the truth and allowing him to get away with murder. No sooner does the Exile return to the Ebon Hawk for departure, than she finds herself being confronted by Darth Nihilus' mysterious apprentice. Of course, it would be anticlimactic if the main character were to die and just end the story here and now, so of course the Exile wins the brief but furious duel, destroying Vices Mars' lightsaber. The Mira Luka begs for death, but the Exile's not that kind of person, and so Vices ends up recuperating in the med bay, despite the skepticism of most of the crew, particularly Kreia. Bizarrely enough, once she's recovered enough to speak, the Sith Assassin just automatically pledges her allegiance to the Exile. But like so many of the other characters in this game, she has to be very cryptic about it. All she will say is that her duty is to prepare the Exile for the day when she has to confront her master, Darth Nihilus. To do otherwise is nothing more than suicide. Next, Nar Shadda, the Smuggler's Moon. And just like in Jedi Knight and Jedi Outcast before it, the introduction begins with a long panning shot between the many buildings of this most infamous hive of scum and villainy. Despite the best efforts of our heroes to remain inconspicuous, their arrival is noted, particularly by the infamous crime lord known only as Goto, a mysterious figure who communicates with his hirelings only through a hologram projected by one of his droids. His instructions are very clear to watch and observe the Exile, keep an eye on all of her movements, but do not interfere with her. An unusual command given the bounty on Jedi heads, but Goto seems to be of the opinion that where this former Jedi goes, others may be found. For now, all that the crew of the Ebon Hawk finds in this particular area of Nar Shadda is a large community of refugees from the recent war being harassed and abused by members of the Exchange and various other crime syndicates. As a crime-ridden ecumenopolis, really love that word, Nar Shadda is teeming with sentient life of every conceivable kind. Besides the humans and the aliens from KOTOR 1, KOTOR includes a bunch of other races from the Star Wars universe. Quarren, Toydarians, Gran, Celestans, Achadra Fan, Deveronians, Gand, Ubis, Trandoshan, and Weeque. As someone who has always loved the aliens of Star Wars and someone who prides himself on his knowledge of the various races of that universe, I was more than a little irritated at myself when I saw the Weeque and Nar Shadda and realized that the race that I thought was Weeque back in KOTOR 1 were actually Nyctos. 
Anyway, the density of sentient life on Nar Shadda is likely the reason why Master Zez Kai-El chose to hide here. All the sapient races living cheek by jowl in this place makes for the perfect camouflage for a Force user. Naturally, this just makes it all the harder for our heroes to try and find him. And so, the Exile begins asking around, as well as lending aid to the people of the refugee section whenever possible all the while being closely watched by the minions of Goto, as well as a few others, namely a human bounty hunter named Mira, and a Wookiee named Hanhar who really, really seems to hate her. While the rest of the Ebon Hawk's crew are surprised or even impressed by the Exile's conduct, Kreia is more than a little contemptuous of it and considers it both foolish and in many ways the wrong thing to do. Kreia is a big believer in the concept of self-reliance, an attitude that is best exemplified by the cutscene known popularly as Kreia's Parable. If the Exile chooses to give a few credits to one of the many beggars of Nar Shadda, Kreia responds thusly. Why did you do such a thing? Such kindnesses will mean nothing. His path is set. Giving him what he has not earned is like pouring sand into his hands. And would that be a kindness? What if by surviving another day he brings a greater darkness upon another? The Force binds all things. The slightest push, the smallest touch, sends echoes throughout life. Even an act of kindness may have more severe repercussions than you know or can see. By giving him something he has not earned, perhaps all you have helped him become is a target. Seeing another elevated often brings the eyes of others who suffer. And perhaps in the end, all you have wrought is more pain. And that is my lesson to you. Be careful of charity and kindness, lest you do more harm with open hands than with a clenched fist. Mind what I have said. Use your power, but in its proper place. To Kreia, compassion is a form of weakness. The Sith hold a similar view, but they revile compassion simply on the basis that, to them, the weak are undeserving of aid and are only to be servants of the strong. Kreia's attitude is a bit more nuanced. Helping the weak may in fact solve their problems in the short term, but when the strong take up the cause and the burdens of the weak upon themselves, they deprive the weak of a chance to become strong themselves. To Kreia, adversity is a crucible through which people strengthen themselves by facing the challenges that life throws their way. Such tempering is denied to those who allow others to face the challenges on their behalf. On the other hand, if the exile chooses the dark side option and basically threatens the man into running away for his impertinence, Kreia will disapprove this needless succumbing to one's own passions. Why did you do such a thing? Giving into your feelings over such a small matter, they would be better served elsewhere. The Force binds all things. The smallest push, the smallest touch, sends echoes throughout life. These acts of cruelty may have more severe repercussions than you know or can see. Cruelty leads to suffering, and when one suffers, it is the way of life to spread suffering. The suffering within builds until its sound is all one hears, and when a kindness is offered, it is punished and a greater darkness is served. From one act can come tremendous power when the echo has traveled as far as it can. Send a great echo, and power will come to you. The day shall come when you contest your strength, I promise you. Kreia is of the opinion that there is a time and a place for things. Needless cruelty is just that, needless, a waste of time and energy. What's more, even the smallest, pettiest abuse can only lead to the spread of more suffering. Once again, it all ties back to the overarching theme of consequence. It's moments like this that make you realize that, rough and unfinished as it is, there are hints of true brilliance in Knights of the Old Republic too. Here is the nuance of gray morality. Unlike the main storyline of Nar Shadda, where your only way to progress is to either help the refugees and cause problems for the scumbag criminals, or help the scumbag criminals against the poor refugees. Among the refugees are a pair of Twi'leks who inform the Exile that they recognize Atten Rand as a murderer. And by confronting him, we finally peel back the sarcastic, annoying facade to find something darker and in some ways genuinely disturbing. Rand had fought in the Mandalorian Wars. Specifically, he had fought in the Mandalorian Wars 
for the Republic, but under the command of Revan. Like many of his comrades, Force-sensitive or otherwise, he resented the imposed inaction of the Jedi Council, that the majority of the Jedi Order refused to do anything as millions died at the hands of the Mandalorians, that they wanted to wait and consider the future ramifications while there was suffering in the here and now. Only Revan and his followers had possessed the will to act in defense of the innocent. But of course, Revan did fall to the dark side, and so many, Republic and Jedi alike, fell with him, including Atten Rand. Although no one, including himself, knew it at the time, Rand had some degree of latent Force sensitivity, which mostly manifested as an ability to conceal his presence from others, including other Force sensitives. And Revan and Malak's new Sith Empire put that talent to good use, training him and others to hunt down and either kill Jedi or capture them so that they could be broken and turned to the dark side. Looking back on it, Atten Rand admits that the worst part about this whole thing was that he enjoyed doing what he did. And he did it, over and over again throughout the course of the Jedi Civil War. But then, at some point near the end of that war, a Jedi found him, an unnamed woman who warned Rand of his Force-sensitive nature and that if his masters ever discovered this truth, they would break him just as they had broken so many others. Still consumed by his resentment and hatred of the arrogant Jedi who had left the galaxy to burn at the hands of the Mandalorians, Rand responded by trying to torture her to death. In her final moments, the Jedi reached into Rand's mind and opened him to the Force, making him see what he was, what he had become, and what he was doing. Rand himself doesn't fully understand what happened next, except that he ultimately killed her out of a twisted kind of love, for a strange bond had formed between torturer and victim. But even the Jedi's death could not erase the revelation she had bestowed upon him, and Rand forsook the Sith cause, consumed by self-loathing. Inevitably, he fled to Nar Shaddaa, and ever since has been scraping by on the ragged edge, just trying to survive. Always projecting an air of sarcastic indifference in order to conceal from others and himself the raw emotional wounds that still echo inside his mind. It took the exile and her willingness to help those in need regardless of any cost to herself that finally began to challenge Rand's deeply held conviction that the Jedi are arrogant and callous. People who hypocritically claim to be the guardians of peace and justice, but who refuse to defend either out of a sense of smug, enlightened superiority. She was, and is, a genuinely good person. Limited, flawed certainly as all of us are but still trying her best to do what is right. And of course, this is why he was initially so desperate to keep his past hidden from her. He is, by his own admission, not just a murderer, but a torturer. How could he expect empathy or forgiveness? Funnily enough, the way I see it, the answer to that question is best articulated by Puss in Boots' The Last Wish. I came here for an arrogant little legend who thought he was immortal. But I don't see him anymore. Atten Rand is a fundamentally broken man, but in part, thanks to the Exile's example, he truly, earnestly wants to do good. If only because maybe by doing so, he can help heal the wounds within himself. And maybe learning the ways of the Force can help him do just that. He's still not my favorite companion character in this game by any means. His personality still remains a little too grating for my liking. But after learning of his backstory, I found that I pitied him more than I disliked him. And after all, in the Star Wars universe, redemption is always an option if you sincerely wish it. And so, with the help of the Exile, Rand's connection to the Force is fully awakened, and he begins the path of becoming a Jedi in his own right. It doesn't mean that he has atoned for all that he's done, and even if the Exile is willing to forgive him his crimes, it doesn't mean that the galaxy will. But he has, in a fundamental way, taken the first step towards making amends. The rest of the Nar Shaddaa storyline is so convoluted that it would take an extra hour to elucidate it even in summary form. 
Of all the worlds in which you the Exile journey to in search of the missing Jedi Masters, it is the most expansive, the one from which the least content was cut by Obsidian in the rush to completion. Suffice it to say that after helping out the refugees a lot, and therefore causing a lot of problems for the exchange, the Exile is lured to a local cantina known as the Jek Jek Tar, and a series of double and triple crosses involving Visquis, another Quarren underling of the mysterious Goto, Mira, the human bounty hunter who both wants to collect the reward on the Exile and expose Visquis as trying to backstab his boss, and Hanhar, the Wookiee, who was hired by Voga the Hutt, one of Goto's rivals, to try and find the secretive crime lord and kill him. Voga has been losing a lot of business to Goto. Every one of his ships that leaves the smuggler's moon is intercepted by the mysterious crime lord. Though supplies include fuel, and the hut is so desperate to get rid of Goto that after a kind of hilarious side quest where either you or one of the female crewmates has to pose as an exotic dancer in order to get close to the hut, Volga is willing to send those vital fuel shipments to Telos and Citadel Station in exchange for his rival's demise, providing the Exile with an opportunity to at least partially make amends for the destruction of Paragus and its vital fuel supply. While the rest of the Ebon Hawks crew fends off an attack by the Exchange, and the Exile tries to escape from the Jek Jek Tar, cutting down most of Visquis's hired muscle, including a small army of Gand and Ubi's mercenaries, Mira is forced to fight and mortally wound Hanhar in single combat, only for Kreia to mysteriously show up out of nowhere and heal the Wookiee's wounds, placing him under a life debt to her, much to the Wookiee's outrage. Not that Kreia particularly cares about the feelings of a being that she refers to dismissively as the Beast, but the mystery of her purpose in saving Hanhar will have to wait for later, like so much else in this game. Meanwhile, Mira links up with the Ebon Hawk's crew and offers to help them free the Exile, who by this point has fallen into Goto's clutches. Partially, at least, at the instigation of Zezkai El, the missing Jedi Master that they've come here to find. One of the reasons Goto has been so hard to find, and in the case of his rivals, kill, is because his ship has a uniquely powerful cloaking device, making it impossible to detect. So how can the Ebon Hawks crew possibly find it? Simply by having Goto find them. T3 steals some transponder codes from a warehouse owned by Voga the Hutt, enabling the Ebon Hawk to change its signature to match that of one of Voga's ships, the very ships that Goto has been preying upon all this time. And so the Ebon Hawk tries to depart Narshada, broadcasting its new signal, only for Goto's yacht, the Visionary, to show up and try and capture it, giving the others their opportunity to board and save the Exile. The actual encounter between the Exile and Goto is pretty brief. Speaking once more through a hologram, the Crime Lord claims that despite being on the wrong side of the law, he has a vested interest in securing the future of the Republic, and believes that the Exile and the Jedi that she's come to find might prove useful in that endeavor. The fact that he wants to hold the Exile as a prisoner and is willing to kill her companions when they come to rescue her means that it is unlikely that there will be any kind of amicable relations between the two. The Exile's companions successfully fight their way to her side and successfully shut off the Visionary's cloaking device, allowing all of Godot's enemies to pounce on him at long last. Our heroes manage to escape the destruction of the Visionary. Somehow, though, so does Goto, who sends his droid as a representative of himself and as a purported ally to the Exile, insisting that they still share similar goals. Once again, this is something to be addressed later on. Finally, after all this trouble, the Exile has that meeting with Zez Kael. He, too, is persuaded to come to Dantooine and even teaches the Exile some new ability in the Force. Like Rook Lamar, he denies the allegation that it was the Council that stripped the Exile of her connection to the Force. Unlike the other Jedi, though, he seems the more open-minded and introspective, willing to concede that there are flaws in the Jedi teachings, which is what led to the Mandalorian Wars and to the Jedi Civil War. He senses that the Jedi squandered a great opportunity when the Exile returned to face judgment. By exiling her, that opportunity was lost, though he remains uncertain as to exactly what that could mean. 
Of course, like Rook Lamar, the Exile has the option of choosing the dark side and killing the Jedi Master. And so, the Exile departs Nar Shadda, this time with the addition of Mira, voiced by Emily Berry, in tow. However, this is only if the Exile follows the light side. In the dark side version, Hanhar kills Mira, but then is gravely wounded again and is broken by the Exile and Kreia into serving the Exile. And so Hanhar becomes a member of the Ebon Hawk's crew. And so, now's as good a time as any to talk a little bit more in depth about the companion characters and the Exile's relationship with them. Over the course of the game, through conversations, the Exile has the option of awakening the other companion characters to the Force the way she did with Rand, thus making them into Jedi characters. And this, I feel, best exemplifies the great strengths of KOTOR 2 and the weaknesses that come from it being rushed in its development. Each of the companion characters has an excellent backstory that the Exile can uncover by conversing with them. And it's upon uncovering the backstories that the Exile can then offer to each companion in turn the opportunity to open themselves up to the Force and become a new generation of Jedi. And that's kind of the problem for me. I don't know if it's because KOTOR 2 was technically unfinished when it came out, though it certainly feels that way. It seems that with the exception of Aten and Kreia, though the latter's case is an entirely different kettle of fish, it seems that the conversation options that allow you to tease out their backstories and later bring them to opening themselves up to the Force are already there for you to use. Of course, if you don't have enough influence with the companion characters, they do have the chance to refuse answering your questions about themselves. But again, the influence can be gained mostly just by talking to them, as well as occasionally have them witness acts of goodness, or evil if you're playing Dark Side, on the part of the Exile. You can have a conversation with them, gain influence, then have another conversation with them and basically complete the process. As a result, it doesn't feel earned the way it should be, at least in my opinion. At least with Rand, you have that conversation with the Twi'lex that unlocks the option for you to confront him about his past. By contrast, almost as soon as Mira joins the crew, you can rack up enough influence in a few conversations to tease out her backstory. How, as a small child, she was captured and later raised by the Mandalorians, only to lose her foundling family at Malachor V, and that despite her work as a bounty hunter, there is a part of her that longs to help those who were scattered by the war as she was. Maybe in this way she can help patch the galaxy together and find a new family for herself. She also reveals the reason why Hanhar hates her so much. Short version is that Hanhar is completely insane. A Wookiee who murdered his own tribe after they were enslaved by Zerka Corporation because this, in his judgment, was proof that they were weak and undeserving of life. He himself was then captured by Zerka, escaped, and then devoted his life to hunting down humans and either killing them or selling them as slaves as a kind of revenge. At one point, he was hired to hunt down Mira on Nar Shadda, only for her to save his life after his own trap backfired on him. By Wookiee custom, this meant that Hanhar owed Mira a life debt, but because of his hatred of humans, he viewed it as an enslavement worse than death. Once the right conversations have been unlocked, the Exile takes Mira to the main area of Nar Shadda and helps her open up her mind to the Force. Initially, she's overwhelmed by all the sensations of all the thoughts of all the living beings in that densely packed city, but the Exile helps her to tone it down a little so that the sensations don't overwhelm her, thus setting her on the path to becoming a Jedi. And I emphasize that this happens within minutes of her joining the crew. Yes, time is elastic in a video game like KOTOR 2, but it still feels too short and too soon. It just doesn't feel like a real sense of progression and there's none of the satisfaction of, say, helping Mission find her lost brother in the first game, or convincing Karth's son to abandon the Sith Academy, or Bastila's reconciliation with her mother. Michael is next. Unfortunately, he is the least interesting of the companion characters, being essentially the Boy Scout of the group. His backstory reveals that he was originally an initiate for Jedi training, and met the Exile during that period when she instructed him and a bunch of other prospective younglings to hear the Force. Michael became greatly enamored of the Exile and hoped that she would pick him to be her apprentice. 
But then the Mandalorian Wars happened, and a lot of Jedi went away to war. No one else ever approached Michael to take him on as an apprentice. He suspects that this is partly due to his open admiration of the Exile, something that the Council would certainly not have approved of. Eventually, he became too old to be considered fit for training, and so decided to serve the Republic instead. His sensitivity to the Force faded with disuse, but after the Exile has talked to him a bit, she can help him regain his connection. Apart from that, Michael's primary role is to be the one who, in conversation, questions the teachings and wisdom of the Jedi Order and the Code. He wonders that there might be some problem with the Code and the teachings of the Jedi, given how often it seems people have fallen to the dark side in recent history. In that sense, he's kind of like Kreia, except he's coming at it from a far more charitable position than the older woman. Bea Dur had joined the Mandalorian Wars because of the attacks on many Zabrak colonies, including his own, and he desired revenge. Obviously, it was during the war where he met the Exile and formed a friendship with her. In the course of the war, his technological brilliance came to the attention of Revan, who commissioned him to create the Mass Shadow Generator, a deadly gravitational superweapon. In point of fact, it was both the Exile and Beodur that Revan placed in charge of the Mass Shadow Generator at the fateful Battle of Malachor V, the battle that ended the Mandalorian Wars. The Republic had lured the Mandalorians into the system, and during the course of the battle, which included Revan killing Mandalore the Ultimate in single combat, the Exile ordered Beodur by a silent nod to activate the Mass Shadow Generator. Countless ships, Republic and Mandalorian alike, and all of the crews aboard, were crushed into Malachor V's surface. The unleashed gravitational energies devastated the system, leading to very few survivors on either side. Beodur was horrified by so many deaths caused by something he had created. Consequently, in the years following the end of the war, Beodur sought to do something creative and constructive with his brilliance, rather than creating more weapons of mass destruction, which is what inevitably led him to working with Chodo Habat and the Ithorians in the attempts to restore Telos. Even so, he is still haunted by the memory of Malachor V, and there is a part of him inside that still nurses anger for the Mandalorians for what they did. Of course, the Exile is able to help him overcome his anger and guilt and establish his connection to the Force. Once again, too quickly and too easily. And what especially irks me is that there is a moment later on in the game, very soon in fact, where there would have been a perfect trigger moment to unlock the opportunity to help Beodur overcome his guilt and his anger. Vizas Mars' revelations are just as disturbing and dark as Aten Ran's, but in a different way. Her homeworld was the Miraluka colony of Qatar, and as Jedi began mysteriously disappearing or dying in the aftermath of the Jedi Civil War, it was here that most of the remaining members of the Order gathered in an attempt to try and figure out what was going on and what they might do to stop it. That unfortunately proved to be their mistake. So many powerful Force sensitives on a world rich with the Force, after all, the Miraluka are the rare example of an entire Force sensitive species, rang out like a dinner bell. And Darth Nihilus was never one to turn down a good meal. Nihilus is often known as the Lord of Hunger, and with good reason. There's a lot more to say about him later on in this video, but suffice it to say, he is a being that feeds upon the Force. Qatar was rendered a barren rock, and apart from Vices, everyone upon it was drained of life. In fact, there's a pretty great short comic that depicts this event, called Unseen Unheard, as well as an immaculate fan animation called Nihilus Fall of Qatar, link in the description. For reasons known only to himself, the Dark Lord spared Mar's life, and used his impressive power over the dark side to bend her to his will in the process, creating a sort of force bond of his own with Vices Mar. It was she who had detected the strange echo in the force emanating from the Exile, and thus Nihilus had sent her to uncover the source of this odd anomaly. Vices is fundamentally a broken woman, riddled with the trauma of her recent past, and at least partially brainwashed into being a loyal servant of the dark side by Nihilus. Even after pledging herself to the Exile, a part of Vices's heart is still twisted with anger at what Nihilus did to her and her world, and a desire for revenge. 
her progression is handled better mostly because it's not about her regaining a connection to the Force like the others. It's more about the Exile offering kindness and help to the Miraluka, helping her see past her trauma and convincing her that the galaxy is something worth saving from the Sith. It also helps that her character arc does not conclude with her re-embracing of the light side, but of overcoming and facing her trauma, which occurs much later in the story. Then there is Brianna the Handmaiden. As with Vysas, her character arc does not end when the Exile awakens Jedi abilities in her, which is why she is one of the better characters alongside the Miraluka. Initially, like her sisters, Brianna makes no secret of her loyalty to Atris. In fact, she so closely identifies herself with her service to the Jedi Master that she doesn't even reveal her name until much, much later. I merely use it for the sake of convenience. As part of the oath to serve Atris, Brianna reveals also that she and her sisters are forbidden from learning the ways of the Force. Of course, initially, she believes that everything that Atris has ever said of the Exile, which isn't very flattering, but over time, through words and deeds, the Exile is able to win her over. From her, we learn that the Achani place high value on combat, viewing it as an ultimate, pure, and honest form of expression, devoid of the misunderstandings that can come from words. Her father was Yusanis, a prominent Yuchani general and experienced warrior. He loved two women in his life. From one union came her five half-sisters, the other handmaidens of Atris. Brianna was the fruit of another union between Usanis and an exiled Jedi named Aaron Kay. Exiled because, of course, she broke the great Jedi taboo that one must not love. Both went off to fight in the Mandalorian Wars alongside the Revenkists, but Kay died at Malachor V and Usanis returned a broken man. He went into politics and even became a senator of the Yachani only to be slain by Revan during the Jedi Civil War. There is, of course, the famous fan theory that Aaron Kay is in fact Kreia, to which, when asked about it, lead designer Chris Avalone could only respond, quote, Can't comment, but good catch. Sorry. Good catch is a phrase that Avalone has used in various Fallout Bibles to indicate an unintended implication which he likes. Of course, if the Exile does decide to train Brianna in the ways of the Force and she accepts, this means breaking the oath to Atris. And it is noteworthy that when she does this, Kreia sends a message to Atris through the Force, signifying her betrayal. Obviously, the droids can't be made Jedi, but at least KOTOR 2 gave T3 a personality, a lack of which I complained about in KOTOR 1. T3 is earnest and devoted to the Exile, and often is hard on himself when things go wrong and he feels he could have done more to solve the problem. It's one reason why I resented Rand's verbal abuse of the astromech earlier in the game. It's like watching someone kick a puppy. HK-47, of course, returns, voiced again by Christopher Tabori, assuming that you can find all the parts needed to repair him. Meaning, once again, that HK-47 is purely optional, but honestly, what sane person would not have the best droid character in all of Star Wars participate in your adventure? Everything out of HK-47's vocabulator is pure gold. From how sick and tired he is of watching idiots try to attack Jedi with blasters. Recitation first. Weapon selection is critical. If I see one more idiot attacking a Jedi with a blaster pistol, then I'll kill them myself to his kinda giving away the secret to beating Darth Sion later on, his outrage at all these inferior HK-50 droids running around, his intense desire to see them all destroyed. I mean, really. They call them organics instead of meatbags, as God intended. Disgraceful. And of course, who could forget his famous impression of Bastila Shan? Mockery. Oh, Master, I love you, but I hate all you stand for. But I think we should go press our slimy, mucus-covered lips together in the cargo hold. Conclusion. Such pheromone-driven human responses never cease to decrease the charge in my capacitors and make me wish I could press a blaster pistol to my behavior core and pull the trigger. As for Goto's droid, it doesn't take long for the Exile to deduce that in fact Goto is just an alias. The real identity is G0T0 that Republic planning droid that was originally working for the Ithorians on Telos, but then went missing. Created to follow two directives, 
one, produce options for the rebuilding of the Republic, and two, follow all of the laws of the Republic. At some point, Goto found that he could not obey both directives, as many of the solutions that he computed that would help the Republic were illegal under Republic law. He then proceeded to suffer the droid equivalent of cognitive dissonance and eventually decided to prioritize only the first directive, help restore the Republic regardless of the legality of the means. Hence why he became a crime lord, creating the false identity of Goto because it knew that no one would willingly follow a droid. It's also why he became obsessed with acquiring a Jedi or even a Sith, as he believed that they would be essential to restoring the Republic, mostly in the belief that they will provide stability, something that the Republic desperately needs right now. Unfortunately, all those bounty hunters working for the Exchange kept misinterpreting his orders, killing all the Jedi they found instead of bringing them to it alive. And so our heroes depart for the next world, Onderon. But of course, as ever, sinister things are afoot. Now that his skeletons are out of the closet, Atten Rand confronts Kreia and tries to claim his independence from her scheming, but Kreia simply informs him that if she wants to break him to her will, she need do nothing more than reach into his mind and dredge up the memory of how he felt when he used to torture Jedi for the Sith Empire. That part of him is still raw and ragged, and something that she can still use against him should the need arise. He'd better pray, therefore, that the need never arises. Meanwhile, Michael has begun looking through the records and has started seeing patterns, both in the destruction and silencing of worlds that were once rich in the Force, and certain actions taken by Revan during both the Mandalorian Wars and after his fall during the Jedi Civil War. However, Kreia can't have him spilling any secrets too soon, and so alters his mind so that he will not remember what he has seen until she deems the time is right. As if we didn't need any further proof that this woman is sinister and has her own motives. Anyway, the Ebon Hawk arrives in the space around Onderon and is almost immediately attacked by ships from the Onderonian Defense Force, forcing everyone to go to ground on the famous moon of Duxon. At long last, I finally know how to pronounce that blasted name. Alas, even without the time crunch, Obsidian likely didn't have the resources to create the kind of Monster Hunter-esque megafauna that are supposed to populate this moon, as was established in the very first issue of Tales of the Jedi. But as the Exile and her companions make their way through the dank, dripping forests of the moon, scattered with the wreckage of one of the most savage battles of the Mandalorian Wars, a battle where the Exile herself had led troops, they encounter something almost as dangerous as the beasts of Duxon, Mandalorians, reorganizing and reforming under the leadership of a new Mandalore. They try to keep the identity a secret, but sorry, Obsidian, even without spoilers, John Sigan's voice is too distinctive and too memorable. It can only be Candorous Ordo. Luckily, he has a shuttle that he sometimes uses to go down to Isis for covert supply runs, and he is willing to take the exile with him, but only if she proves her worth. By which I mean she does a bunch of side quests and or fights a few Mandalorians in the sparring ring. There is a brief but intriguing cutscene where Kreia addresses Mandalore, and after the usual snide comments that one has come to expect from Kreia up to this point, she makes the revelation that it was Revan who instructed Candorus to reform the Mandalorian clans, though we won't get any hints as to the reasons why until later. There is a brief assault on the Mandalorian camp by a small army of stealthed Sith assassins, but they are easily handled, and at last, in an albeit roundabout way, our heroes make it down to Iziz, or rather, Iziz as they pronounce it, the capital of Onderon. Onderon is by far my favorite planet in Knights of the Old Republic 2, mostly because, one, while it is still an urban environment, it has a distinctive look that sets it apart from the more modular industrial settings of places like Citadel Station or Nar Shadda, and two, because bathed in the golden light of afternoon, it's the only planet in the game that isn't somber and gloomy. It's not really an indictment of the other worlds, as it is consistent with the tone of the game, this is just personal preference speaking here. However, just like Manan in KOTOR 1, Onderon in KOTOR 2 is a world where simmering tensions bubble away beneath the surface of an otherwise pretty face. 
For full historical context, check out my video on the first part of the Tales of the Jedi comic series from 1995. Here's the short version, though. The people of Onderon have always been under threat from the Moon Beasts of Duxon, who are able to cross over to the world because the orbit of Duxon is such that it comes close enough to Onderon to allow safe travel. To defend themselves from these mega predators, the people of Onderon eventually constructed Isis, a great fortress city the size of a small continent, riddled with gun turrets. In fact, in KOTOR 2, you can clearly see various turbolaser batteries on certain parts of the wall, a legacy of this ancient struggle for survival. At the same time that they were defending themselves against perennial incursions by the moon beasts of Duxon, the city dwellers of Isis were also fighting a generations-long protracted war against the Beast Riders, the descendants of criminals expelled from the protection of Isis, who eventually learned to survive in the wilds and even tame the Moon Beasts and use them as war mounts. At some point in time during this long-drawn-out conflict known as the Beast Wars, Isis was taken over for a time by a petty fallen Jedi named Freedon Nad who, in the course of his lifetime, managed to establish a royal dynasty descended from him and a cult that worshipped the dark side, with Nad himself, in death, serving as a kind of religious totem. This all came to an end in 4000 BBY, when a group of Jedi, including Master Arka Jeth and his then-student Ulic Keldroma and Nomi Sunrider, succeeded in purging the Nadist cult from Isis and helped broker a final and lasting peace between the city dwellers and the beast riders, a peace cemented by the marriage of Gallia, last member of the royal line, and her great love, the beast rider Auron Kira. At the same time, Onderon became a member world of the Old Republic. That was 49 standard years ago. And, what with the chaos and destruction wrought across the galaxy by the Sith War, the Mandalorian Wars, and the Jedi Civil War, many Onderonians are of the opinion that membership in the Old Republic has done little to recommend itself to them. And so our heroes and Mandalore arrive on Isis to find the population of the city increasingly divided between two factions. The pro-Republic faction, led by the sovereign monarch of Isis, Queen Talia, voiced by Sita Indrani, and a separatist faction, led by Queen Talia's cousin and commander of the armies, the charismatic General Vaklu, voiced by Nick Chilvers. And once again, I look for the purported grey morality and nuance, and I am not seeing it. The political situation in Onderon, the perfect environment for wading through this kind of moral ambiguity, ultimately does fall once again into the classic good-evil binary. The Republic, even weak and diminished as it is now, helps bring prosperity to Onderon through trade and protection through its fleet. Yet, despite the fact that Onderon has suffered like so many worlds in the recent wars, the Republic still demands that Onderon's resources be sacrificed in the cause of rebuilding dead worlds like Telos simply because Onderon wasn't damaged as much. Plus, without the intervention of Revan and his crusaders during the Mandalorian Wars, the Republic proved to be not so very effective at protecting Onderon in the first place. Not to mention the fact that exposure to the ways of the Republic has begun in some ways to erode the traditions and culture of Onderon itself, an important aspect of its people's sense of identity. These are valid points on both sides of the divide, and yet Queen Talia, advised in secret by Jedi Master Kavar, is portrayed as a stainless and virtuous leader, while Vaklu, who is a decorated war hero and led the Onderonian resistance to Mandalorian incursion, uses propaganda to spread false information of Republic treachery, uses troops loyal to him as armed thugs to suppress and intimidate journalists and others loyal to Talia, and, we later discover, is in secret alliance with the Sith to help him usurp the throne from his cousin. Once again, I am confronted by the staggering irony that a single questline from KOTOR 1, a game that wasn't trying to be morally ambiguous, has more moral ambiguity in it than the majority of the main storyline of KOTOR 2. After helping Mandalore's contact man in Isis, Dagon Ghent, by proving him innocent of a charge of murder, he reveals that he has connections in the royal palace and can put the exile in touch with Master Kavar. There is a quick bit of busy work first, 
While he was arrested, Dagon Ghent's home was ransacked by a bunch of local thugs, who among other things stole a bunch of data disks that includes the information that he can use to contact Kavar, and you have to get it back from them. But at this point, thanks to Kreia's teachings, the Exile has become strong in the Force once again, and dealing with the thieves is basically a wash. Unfortunately, the meeting with Kavar doesn't last very long before they are suddenly interrupted by a posse of Vaklu's men, led by his chief lackey, Colonel Tobin, voiced by David Robb. Kavar stuns Tobin's men long enough to make his escape, instructing the exile to flee and telling her that he will contact her once again once he is able to. In the end, the exile, Mandalore, and the others are forced to fight their way through hordes of Vaklu supporters back to the shuttle and flee to the safety of Duxon. Until Kavar contacts them again, there's really nothing for our heroes to do except search for the last remaining Jedi Master, Lona Vash, on Korriban. Mandalore chooses to accompany the Exile, partly out of opposition to a mutual enemy. After all, the Mandalorians didn't exactly do so well when they sided with Exar Kun during the Sith War, and in the hopes that he might find other Mandalorians or even Mandalorian clans that he can turn to his cause. And in fact, if you go to Dantooine or Nar Shadda, you can find other Mandalorians for him to recruit. Going back to what I said earlier about the companion characters, I think Candorus joining the Ebon Hawk's crew should have been the point where you could unlock the ability to make Beodur a Jedi. There are even cutscenes where the Mandalore and Beodur have a verbal confrontation about Malachor V, the casualties of the Mandalorian Wars, and of course the Mandalorian's particularly savage conception of honor. Like the Twi'leks on Nar Shadda, I think this should have been the moment that would trigger the ability for the Exile to have Beodur come clean about the lingering guilt and anger in his heart, giving the Exile the opportunity to help him heal himself mentally, rather than being able to draw it out of him after a few conversations almost immediately after he joins the crew. But now, last and certainly not least, on to Korriban the only other planet in the game apart from Dantooine that also featured in KOTOR 1. Unlike Dantooine, Korriban looks exactly the same as it did in the previous game, right down to the perpetual evening light bathing the tombs and obelisks. In a way, that's perfectly appropriate. Korriban was always a tomb world, a place where the great and bad of the ancient Sith empires of old were laid to rest. The only difference is that now there are no longer any living Sith running around. At least, not yet. Kreia point-blank refuses to accompany the Exile on this one, though, through the mental link of their Force Bond, she is still in communication with her. Amusingly, in my opinion anyway, if you walk up to one of the four Sith tombs near the Ebon Hawk, she'll give essentially a brief tour guide backstory of each Sith Lord that was entombed there. The famous Sith Blademaster Tulak Horde, Naga Sato and Marka Ragnos, who have appeared in multiple Star Wars properties, and even, and most interestingly, the Tomb of Ajunta Paul, the Sith ghost that Revan helped put to rest back in KOTOR 1. Kreia, of course, doesn't think much of the concept of redemption and disapproves of Revan saving Ajunta Paul's ghost. She describes redemption as cowardly, a betrayal of one's nature, and a kind of spiritual collapse. To which I would proffer the question, even if that's true, if your nature is that of an evil asshole, is such a betrayal really a bad thing? Interestingly enough, if the Exile continues to assert the Jedi conviction that no one is beyond redemption, you still gain influence with Kreia which is unusual as most of the time you disagree with her, you lose influence, whether you disagree with her on a light side decision or a dark side decision. A little bit of subtle foreshadowing there, quite clever. Our heroes go looking for Lana Vash inside what was once the old academy from the previous game. And the only difference between this game and KOTOR 1 is that the stone corridors are silent. No Sith training in combat or learning to torture living beings or otherwise studying the ways of the dark side, just another tomb, haunted only by feral monsters and the whisperings of the long, long dead. And it turns out that Lana Vash is very much one of the dead, having been tortured to death by a being who, according to her datapad's description, could only be Darth Sion. 
Speak of the devil and he appears, as the old saying goes. Did you come here for answers? There are none. The call of Korriban is strong, but it is the call of the dead. I have studied you, immersed myself in you. I know the paths you walked in exile. I know your teacher. I know the fires that raged upon the ducks and moon while the Republic died around you. You know war. You know battle. And I know of Malachor. You know what it means to be broken. The one who travels with you will destroy you, as she did me. I can end it before it begins. I know her as an apprentice knows their master, and as a master knows an apprentice. I want her to die and see all that she has built cast down, all that she holds dear in shards at her feet. She clings to hope that perhaps she can train one as great as her first. She is a fool who escaped death once. She will not do so again. But you do not know her as I do. You have not survived her teachings as I have. And you have not bested her in battle as I have. You are nothing. Yet still she walks with you. Is willing to sacrifice herself for you. You are a wretched thing. A thing of weakness and fear. You are her apprentice in name only. I am the master. And that is why you will die. Here I must praise KOTOR 2 for learning the lesson of KOTOR 1. You remember how in that previous video I complained about the fight with Malak, the first fight I mean, aboard the Leviathan. How it's a boss fight that you technically win by whittling down his health bar to the end before he suddenly force freezes Revan. I criticize this moment because you technically win the boss fight and it kind of undermines Malak a little as a final antagonist. KOTOR 2 does not make the same mistake. Yes, you get a few shots in on Scion, but then Kreia informs you that there's no chance of winning and so the exile has to flee. The only thing I would do differently in that situation is I wouldn't have there be a health bar at all. Really emphasize Scion's, quote, invincibility here. After, quote, escaping from Darth Scion, there is only one place left to explore. A cave. A dark side cave. And, in my opinion, the best part of the entire story of KOTOR 2. Chris Avalone said that he poured over every piece of Star Wars media that existed up to 2003 in preparation for this game. And it's a moment like this that makes me believe every word of that statement. Of course, one only needs to have seen the original trilogy, and particularly The Empire Strikes Back, to know where Avalone got the idea for this little encounter. And you must go. What's in there? Only what you take with you. Technically, the order of the planets that you go to in the course of KOTOR 2 doesn't really matter, just as it didn't in the first game. However, just like with the first game, most of the people who have played KOTOR 2 recommend that, as with KOTOR 1, it is best to do Korriban last. On its own, the Vision Cave, as I like to call it, is an excellent piece of Star Wars storytelling. In the context of having done the other planets, having learned so much about the Exile's backstory from interactions with Kreia, the Jedi Masters, and even other characters like Beadur, it is nothing less than a tour de force. Whatever my ultimate thoughts are on Knights of the Old Republic II The Sith Lords, the Dark Side Vision Cave on Korriban ranks as one of the best moments in all of Star Wars. One of the major recurring themes of this storyline is the idea of actions having consequences. And this is the moment that really drives that theme home. It's really nothing but highlights. Reliving the Battle of Duxin, where the general, as a commanding officer, sent men and women to their deaths. The confrontation with the specter of Darth Revan, representing the dark path the Exile could have gone down had she not turned away from the war after Malachor V 
And of course, the famous apathy is death moment. But the true piece de resistance, the best of the best, is for me, the Malik recruitment vision. Malik, voiced again by Raphael Ferrer, just as he was in KOTOR 1, confronts the exile, and by extension you the player, with that fateful decision to join the Mandalorian Wars or not to join. Now, with the full 2020 hindsight of knowing exactly what happened after, would you still join the war? Or would you listen to the advice of the Council this time? If you do join the war, do you regret that decision? Do you own it? Would you go even farther this time and follow Malak and Revan in their fall to the dark side? Was the carnage of the Mandalorian Wars truly worse than the horrors wrought by the Jedi Civil War? And even if there were those who chose not to join the Mandalorian Wars, that doesn't mean that they didn't have their own doubts about whether or not their choice was right. And such doubts can lead to anger and hatred at you for making the choice that they could not. Every action the Revenkists took was made in the conviction that they were doing the right thing. But so did the Spanish Inquisition, the Jacobins, the Confederates, the Nazis, the Communists. So did Ulic Keldroma. So did Anakin Skywalker. And what were the results of those convictions but blood, horror, and suffering? For a dark side playthrough, this scene is pretty good. But for a light side player, it means so much more because there is no clear right answer. Admittedly, this would have been a lot more mind-blowing for me had I first played this when it came out when I was a teenager, as opposed to looking at it now from the perspective of a guy in his early 30s with almost two decades more life experience. But that doesn't make the message any less profound. Nor does it persuade me that for all that this game critiques Star Wars, that the creators of KOTOR 2 do not love Star Wars as well. Whatever one thinks about the failings of the Jedi Code, at least in my opinion, I don't think that this invalidates the fundamental morals of Star Wars. Yes, sometimes there are no easy answers. Yes, sometimes there are unexpected consequences, sometimes really bad ones. There are almost never any truly painless solutions for the trials of life that have any real meaning to them. Whether it's the protagonist of a fictional story, or you yourself being the real-life protagonist of your own life story. Whatever the choices we make, whatever the mistakes we make, we can all only do the best we can based on what we know. Star Wars just happens to be a universe where sometimes doing the best you can involves saving the entire galaxy. And so the exile emerges from the cave, tempered with a better understanding of herself and all that has led her to this point. The confrontation with Sion unlocks a few new conversation options with Kreia, and it is from these that we learn most of what we ultimately come to learn about the major antagonists of this game, Darth Sion and Darth Nihilus. Sion can best be summarized as the man literally too angry to die meme made flesh. He is rightly named the Lord of Pain. His body is literally a decaying, crumbling husk, riddled with the countless wounds inflicted upon him over the course of his life, never healing, only existing in a constant state of agony. And this agony is the source of his strength. He channels the pain to fuel his negative emotions, his anger and his hatred, and through these emotions, he uses the force to literally hold himself together. This is what makes him seemingly invulnerable, as long as he metaphorically has the dark side of the Force by the throat, he can never truly die. His only goal is to eradicate the Jedi and inflict as much pain and suffering upon them as he does so. As for Darth Nihilus, the Lord of Hunger, he is in many ways even more of a shell of a man than even Sion. Kreia describes him as a wound in the Force, more presence than flesh. He is, in a way, a kind of living force ghost, a ghost that hungers, constantly, eternally, hungering for life itself. Whatever he once was, Nihilus is a being consumed by his hunger. He has no ego and no will apart from the need to satisfy a hunger that will never be satisfied. 
Kraya believes that he will either become powerful enough to consume all life in the galaxy, or he will destroy himself when his hunger exceeds his ability to satiate it. Either way, he represents a terrible danger to the galaxy. If the Exile's influence with Kraya is high enough, she will at this point reveal that she was once a mentor of Revan's. Though in truth, Revan had many mentors, always eager to expand his power and knowledge of the Force. Though Kraya says, admittedly a little smugly, that he often kept coming back to her. She has a, shall we say, unique perspective on Revan. She refers to him as the heart of the Force, a being who radiated power. She also questions if Revan really did fall to the dark side after Malachor V and the Mandalorian Wars, or if he had always been true to his nature, a being guided not by circumstance or even the Force, but by his own will. Speaking of Revan, back aboard the Ebon Hawk, Michael reveals something that he's discovered recently. He was studying the patterns of Sith attacks during the Jedi Civil War and after, and it seems to have led him to a somewhat unnerving conclusion that even when he was Dark Lord of the Sith, Revan was preparing the galaxy for something, seeking to unite it against something, something terrible that existed beyond the edges of known space. But there is little time for such speculation, as a message from Kavar via the Mandalorians on Duxin reaches the crew of the Ebon Hawk, and the time has come to return to Isis and have a proper conversation with the Jedi Master. There's just the teeny weeny little problem of a civil war breaking out in the capital of Onderon to deal with first. General Vaklu has decided to make his move. While his followers fight Queen Talia's loyalists in the streets of Isis itself, Vaklu's Sith allies are up to something funny on Duxon. The Exile sends some of her crew to deal with whatever is going on with the Sith on Duxon, while she leads the rest in an attack on Isis to stop Vaklu's plan from succeeding. The team on Duxon, supported by the Mandalorians, discover that in exchange for helping Vaklu with his coup, the Sith have been granted access to the old tomb of Frida Nad, the Sith Lord who had once been ruler of Onderon. They managed to interrupt the Sith from performing a ritual that would use the dark side to strengthen Vaklu's forces, using the sarcophagus of Frida Nad himself as a focus of dark side energy. The tomb itself is pretty sinister and grandiose, just like it was in the Tales of the Jedi comic back when Exar Kun began exploring it. And I have to say, most of the famous Sith Lords in the history of Star Wars had big, grand ambitions. Things like taking over the galaxy or the extermination of all Jedi. And yet here is Freedon Nad, a Sith Lord who set himself up as little more than a petty despot over Isis. He technically didn't even rule the whole planet of Onderon as the Beast Riders defied him throughout his life. Knowing this and looking at the temple interior, it kind of gives you the feeling that maybe Nad and his followers were compensating for something. Meanwhile, the Exile and the rest of the team are given a quick way down to Isis via, well, what the Mandalorians call a basilisk war droid, but to my eye looks like a knockoff of the Virago from Shadows of Empire. Apparently a good deal of retconning was required to essentially say that this is a different type of basilisk war droid. Why the need for this retconning at all? Because apparently Chris Avalone thought that the original basilisk design dreamed up by Christian Gossett for the Tales of the Jedi comic was, and I quote, really stupid. Really stupid, Mr. Avalone. You are writing a story for a setting that is avowedly science fantasy. You have a main villain who is essentially a walking dead extra, Another villain who is essentially no face from Spirited Away's edgier cousin in terms of the wardrobe department. A woman whose idea of traditional combat training attire is a string bikini and a man with a laser beam where his elbow ought to be. But this is really stupid in your eyes. This is bullshit. 
When I ragged on the concept of intentment for being silly in Trusa Pakura, my opinion was based on the context of the internal logic of the Star Wars universe, namely the idea that in a world where things like power converters, ion capacitors, and other forms of technological batteries are most definitely a thing, the idea of a spacefaring civilization powering everything from a droid fighter to an electric toothbrush by sucking the life force out of other beings is ridiculously inefficient. Whereas Mr. Avalone's objection seems to be based purely on design aesthetics. Well, I for one vehemently disagree with that opinion. As did the people behind the KOTOR prequel comic, The Force Unleashed, The Star Wars Galaxies MMO, and The Old Republic. Anyway, the exile makes it safely down to Isis and into the middle of a civil war. After using one of Isis's many wall turrets to shoot down a bunch of Vaklu's fighters, and then fighting their way through Vaklu's men and the Sith assassins in support of them, they manage to make it to the royal palace, only to find the way blocked by the ever weaselly Colonel Tobin, some Sith and a particularly nasty-looking critter called a Drexel larva, apparently the immature form of the giant winged monstrosities that used to be favored as mounts by the old Beast Riders. It's a pretty high-stakes moment, especially given the fact that Queen Talia is literally fighting for her life in a sword duel against Vaklu at that very moment, which is admittedly a little undermined by the fact that when you finally manage to get to Tobin, he's killed by the Drexel larva itself, and his only response is... Don't blast it all! Turns out, Talia is able to handle Vaklu, while the Exile, her allies, and Kavar can handle Vaklu's men. You do have the option to either kill Vaklu yourself or convince Queen Talia to let him live. Naturally, the dark side path is where you side with Vaklu and end up killing Master Kavar in a duel. Canonically, though, Vaklu is deemed by the Queen far too dangerous to be left alive. The man literally says that if she puts him in a prison cell, he'll bust out within a week like an idiot. So, of course, firing squad. At last, the exile can meet with Master Kavar, and he makes a few interesting revelations. Namely, that the Jedi Masters weren't just hiding out on all these worlds at random, they deliberately chose these places because they'd been touched by the war the Mandalorian Wars. Kavar believes that somehow the Exile is the key to defeating the Sith. And so Dantooine, Nar Shadda, and Onderon were chosen because they were places connected to the Exile's past, therefore places that she might visit again. Like Zez Kael, Kavar also expresses some degree of regret for sending the Exile into, well, exile. When she initially stood before the Council in judgment, the council members felt as though something inside her, as if the Force itself had died, leaving only an empty, echoing hollowness. They also felt these echoes on these war-torn worlds, and on the worlds attacked by the Sith, particularly those ravaged by Darth Nihilus. Like Vruk Lamar and Zez Kael before him, Kavar denies that the council had anything to do with severing the Exile's connection to the Force. At any rate, now that the Sith have come out into the open with the attack on Onderon, Kavar believes that it is time for the Jedi Masters to reconvene on Dantooine as was originally planned. While all this talking is going on, Kreia sneaks off and finds Colonel Tobin, mortally wounded but not beyond saving. Claiming to be an ally of Vaklu's, she informs the Colonel that the failure to overthrow Queen Talia was all the Jedi's doing and that they have a secret academy on Telos. If there is still a chance for Onderon to gain its independence from the Republic, Tobin has to run off and inform the Sith of this fact. Which, of course, he runs off to do. And so, our heroes make their way to Dantooine, and KOTOR 2 the Sith Lords enters its endgame. There's simply no way that any words of mine could do the following scene justice, so I'm going to let KOTOR 2 speak for itself. It... it is different. It has been some time.
need to rest. Go on. The council awaits. I will remain here. Yes. Afraid for you. As I always have been, I will be fine here. Whatever answers the council have are for you. Know that much may happen here, but above all, do not forget this. You may trust in me. We cradle each other's lives, and what threatens one of us, threatens us both. And if you find you cannot trust me, trust in your training, trust in yourself. Never doubt what you have done. All your decisions have brought you to this point. And now, perhaps, they shall see what you have. It is not as it was. But perhaps that is for the best. We were wondering when you would arrive. This moment has taken some time to reach us. And I imagine you have many questions. Or perhaps you've come for revenge. You already know the answer. You've noticed it in those who travel with you. Have you noticed that when you act, others follow? Those that travel with you? They follow you without question, without hesitation. Against their instincts, and sometimes against their sense. It is because you are a leader, but that still fails to grasp the meaning of what I'm trying to tell you. It is not an easy thing to explain. Surely you are familiar with force bonds. It is the bond that develops between apprentice and master when one truly understands another. It is developed over time through understanding of each other. And yet you do it so easily and we do not know why. You make connections through the force and it resonates with those who travel with you. The resonance is even greater when they too are force sensitive. Your actions affect others more than you know. You draw others to you, especially those strong in the Force. When you suffer, their spirit echoes it. And when they are in pain, their pain becomes yours. We do not know, but it is not the first time you felt the weight of so many lives. And that is why the Mandalorian Wars echo within you still. We did not cut you off from the Force. You were merely deafened to it. Because of that last battle of the Mandalorian Wars. The screams of countless thousands, Jedi and Mandalorians, crushed by the planet's gravity, annihilated. Their lives still scream across the surface of that dead planet, and within you, to hear the Force over such pain. It is not possible. It was too much for any Jedi to endure, and it is a wonder that you did not die there when thousands perished. All those you had fought with, struggled with. You cut yourself off because you had to if you were to survive. You had hints of it in the war on Doxon. Malachor was simply the final blow. You were deafened. At last, you could hear. You were broken. You were whole. You were blinded. And at last, you saw. When you returned to us, we saw what had happened. You carry all those deaths at Malachor within you. And it has left a hole, a hunger that cannot be filled. In you, we saw a wound in the Force. In you, we saw the end of the Force. Yes. You can feel the Force, but you cannot feel yourself. You are a cipher, forming bonds, leeching the life of others, siphoning their will and dominating them. It is the teaching of these new Sith. To feed on others, on other Force-sensitives. 
They are symptomatic of the wound in the Force. You are a breach that must be closed. You transmit your pain, your suffering through the Force. Within you we see something worse than merely the teachings of the Sith. What you carry may mean the death of the Force and the death of the Jedi. So you think. It is not the strength of a Jedi you feel. He's right. It's all the death you've caused to get here. You feed on it, and you grow stronger. You're like Malachor. It's in you, it's what you are now. You must have noticed as you fought across all these planets, killing hundreds, only to become more and more powerful. Why do you think that was? But what's worse is that bonding you have. It hasn't gone away. It's gotten stronger, and the more attachments you form, the more you draw others to you. And that is why you are a threat to us all. What if other Jedi went to war as you did, suffered the same events, and emerged as you did? What if there was a crucible that trained such Jedi to consume and kill? For you, Malachor was that crucible. What's worse is the Sith that we face. I fear that they have learned the lesson of Malachor all too well. It is what allows them to prey on Force users, to become stronger when Force sensitives are near. Somehow they have learned their hunger from you, and so you have brought about the end of the Jedi, and perhaps all the knowledge of the Force. But it is of no consequence. Your ability to make such connections, such bonds, so easily are why you cannot remain. You are a threat to living creatures and all who feel the Force. You will lead the Sith here, and that we cannot allow. Our judgment before remains. Exile. You must leave. And you must leave without your tie to the Force. It is a punishment reserved for only a few, and only when necessary. But we have the power to cut you off from the Force, and it must be done. Forgive us. But it is necessary. Do not be afraid. You shall feel no pain, but this must be done. As long as you feel the Force, you are a danger to those around you. Enough! Step away from her. What? Step away! She has brought truth, and you condemn it. The arrogance. You will not harm her. You will not harm her ever again. I thought you had died in the Mandalorian Wars. Die? No. Became stronger. Yes. Is this your new master, Exile? If so, then you follow Revan's path. Her teachings will cause you to fall as surely as he did. He sought to lure the Sith out, and now they have come to us. As you would pass judgment on her, I have come to pass judgment on you all. Do you wish to hear the teachings born of the Mandalorian Wars? Of all wars, of all tragedies that scream across the galaxy? Let me show you, you, who have forever seen the galaxy through the Force. See it through the eyes of the Exile. How could you ever hope to know the threat you face, when you have never walked in the dark places of the galaxy, faced war and death on such a scale? If you had traveled far enough, rather than waiting for the Echo to reach you, perhaps you would have seen it for what it was. There is a place in the galaxy, where the dark side of the Force runs strong. It is something of the Sith, but it was fueled by war. It corrupts all that walks on its surface drowns them in the power of the dark side. It corrupts all life, and it feeds on death. Revan knew the power of such places, and the power in making them. They can be used to break the will of others, of Jedi, promising them power and turning them to the dark side. Did you never wonder how Revan corrupted so many of the Jedi, so much of the Republic, so quickly? The Mandalorian Wars were a series of massacres that masked another war, a war of conversion culminating in a final atrocity that no Jedi could walk away from, save one. And that is what I sought to understand. How one could turn away from such power 
give up the Force and still live. But I see what happened now. It is because you were afraid. There are a lot of things that are really clever in this scene. Namely, how the influence mechanic and the basic RPG feature of gaining experience through killing enemy mooks is explained in terms of the lore of the universe. That said, given the doubts that Zezkael and Kavar express earlier in the game, it is kind of odd that all three masters would be unified in dogmatic condemnation of the exile. But I think most will agree that the highlight of this scene, and indeed the rest of the game going forward, is Kreia. Kreia has always been a mysterious figure, if her cryptic comments, her oblique moral lessons, and her shifty dealings behind the exile's back weren't already an indication of this. The reveal that she is in fact the final boss of Knights of the Old Republic 2 is no great shock. To anyone who failed to see that one coming, my condolences on your glaucoma diagnosis. But from here on out, at long last, the pieces begin to fall into place. At long last, the motivations and goals of this mysterious woman, who is neither Jedi nor Sith, begin to reveal themselves. Kreia convinces Brianna to take her back to Telos for a confrontation with Atris, while the rest of the Ebon Hawks crew receives word of Darth Nihilus and his ship, the Ravager, heading directly for that same world. In the Dark Side version of events, Kreia asks the Exile if killing the Jedi Masters who wronged her by expelling her from the Order, by getting revenge, has she truly found any peace or satisfaction? Whatever the Exile's response in that regard, Kreia dismisses her as yet another failure. Then, she injures the Exile using their Force Bond and departs for Telos. Not as dramatic, but still a very well done moment. Both light and dark side scenes are sold in large part through the brilliant writing and through Sarah Kestelman's vocal performance. Before the rest of the crew head off to Telos, Michael senses the Exile's distress and decides to have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart with her. Given his expressed doubts about the Jedi teachings and how failings within them may have been what caused the fall of people like Revan, Ulic Kaldroma, and Exar Kun, it only makes sense here that when the Exile expresses doubts to him about her being a wound in the Force, draining life from others like a smaller scale version of Darth Nihilus, or the fact that she might be brainwashing people to follow her without her realizing it, Michael is the one to deny this. The perennial issue with the Jedi Order after the Great Sith War has been their propensity to become far too detached from the lives of the people that they are sworn to protect. It's one thing to not allow your emotions, your passions to master you. It's quite another to reject them to the point where you can't really empathize with people who do feel. A particularly noteworthy example off the top of my head actually comes from Revenge of the Sith. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy. The shadow of greed, that is. This is genuinely sage advice and an appropriate way to deal with mortality. But presumably Yoda, like all the Jedi of that time, had no emotional bonds with people, let alone with family members. And Anakin would have known this, so of course it was going to be hard for him to relate to that kind of perspective. Perhaps if the Jedi Order had been more permissive in such matters, allowed its members to experience the loss of that which you love, maybe Anakin might have internalized that wisdom, because it would be coming from a place of genuine understanding, as opposed to being based in abstract philosophy. At any rate, this is hardly the time for lengthy existential self-examinations. There is a world to save, if not an entire galaxy. Of course, Kreia and Brianna get there ahead of the Ebon Hawk, and Kreia goes off to meet Atris for a little... chat. And quite a setting it is, too. Very scenic, very atmospheric, all those glowing red Sith holocrons. And of course, Kreia confirms what any reasonably observant player would have noticed from the get-go. That if Atris hadn't already fallen to the dark side by now, she was certainly well on the way. A little on the nose, don't you think, Obsidian? 
Meanwhile, Brianna confronts the other handmaidens, her half-sisters, and, with her new command of the Force, defeats them without causing any permanent damage. This is where her character arc culminates with the revelation of her name, a symbol of embracing her own individuality, as a person and as a Jedi. Of course, she's no match for her former mistress, and only the intervention of the Exile saves her from perhaps being killed by a furious Atris. Of course, the Exile wins the duel, but decides to spare her old enemy. There has been enough anger and hatred between them, and perhaps Exile will be a salutary lesson for Atris, just as it was for the Exile. Of course, alternatively, you can choose to kill her, or even leave her to the mercy of the spirits haunting the Sith holocrons. A defeated Atris admits that, behind her hostility towards the Exile for going against the Council, she secretly envied her for the willingness to go fight the Mandalorians. She herself had lacked the will to do so. And if you play the Exile as a male, there is even implications in the dialogue that Atris loved the Exile as well. Atris had furiously denied her own doubts about the Council's decision to not get involved in the Mandalorian Wars. But like so many, the Jedi Order and its teachings were a foundation of her own identity. What would it mean for her if she internalized the idea that maybe the Council had been wrong? Those doubts and her envy of the Exile for making the decision that she could not had festered within her all those years, had festered into anger and hatred. Only stubborn denial had prevented Atris from acknowledging her own fall to the dark side, only for those self-delusions to be stripped away by Kreia. Speaking of Kreia, it is from Atris that the Exile finally begins to learn what her old master has been planning all this time. Many years ago, the woman now known as Kreia had been exiled from the Jedi Order, partly for her radical ideas and interpretations of the Force, and partly because she was blamed for being a negative influence on Revan, which had contributed to his own fall to the dark side. In reality, Kreia had been just as puzzled by Revan's fall as anyone else, and had sought to understand what had happened to him. This path had inevitably led her to Malachor V and the great wound in the Force left behind by the mass shadow generator. It was there that she learned great knowledge of the dark side, but also fell under its influence. Determined to destroy the Jedi that had cast her out, she sought out other wounds in the Force, which had eventually led her to other victims of Malachor V, Sion and Nihilus. They were her apprentices, but, like all Sith apprentices, the time came when they eventually decided to turn against their old master. The betrayal, plus being stripped of the Force by Sion and Nihilus, left Kreia with a new, unshakable conviction that neither Jedi or Sith deserved to win the petty war that they had waged against one another since the dawn of history. That endless cycles of conflict and suffering was the doing of the Force itself, and that the only way to end it would be to free the galaxy from its influence. But she had no way of making such a thing possible, until she heard of and later encountered the Exile. Someone who had lost their connection to the Force not because it had been severed by another, but had deafened herself to it by her own volition. For Kreia, the Exile is the ultimate proof that life can exist without the Force. Which, as I'm sure will delight many a prequel hater, makes this a direct refutation of this little exchange from The Phantom Menace. Without the Midichlorians, life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. Now that she knows such a thing is possible, so Atris believes, Kreia intends to go back to Malachor V, to that great wound in the Force that was created at the end of the Mandalorian Wars. She will lure the Exile there by threatening to kill her through their Force bond if she doesn't come. And once she does come, Kreia intends to kill her. The Force wound within the Exile will resonate with the wound in the Force created at Malachor V itself and open that wound even more. Open it so far and so wide that it would sever the entire galaxy from the Force. Thus, as Kreia believes, liberating all life from its dominating influence. However, the Force is connected to all living things, 
and very few have the will to do what the exile did, to turn away from the force and survive. If Kreia succeeds, then not only will every Force-sensitive likely die as the Jedi Masters did on Dantooine, but untold trillions of ordinary men, women, and children will also perish. All this time, Kreia has played the spider, manipulating events behind the scenes, weaving a web that will ensnare and destroy the Force and those whom she regards as its slaves. Kreia has always disdained weakness, and in her eyes, both the Jedi and the Sith exemplify weakness, using the Force as a crutch, growing stronger as Force users, but never as people. Before she could destroy the Force, she had to destroy its servants. And so Kreia lied to the Exile, claiming that it had been the Council that had stripped her of her connection to the Force. This personal motive, combined with the greater need to stand against the Sith, as intended, motivated the Exile to seek out the remaining Jedi Masters. The Exile would then either kill the Masters, or she would lure them to Dantooine so that they would all be together in one place to be judged. The exact nature of that judgment will have to wait till the end of the story, though. Now that the Jedi are eliminated, it is time to clean house with the Sith. It's why she opened Atrus's eyes to the reality of her own fall. It's also why she told Tobin of the Academy packed full of Jedi on Telos because she knew he would run to Nihilus and it would lure the Lord of Hunger back out into the open. If things continue according to plan, the Exile will destroy her two former Dark Side pupils and then Master and Apprentice will confront one another one last time. And here, alas, is where the effects of the rush development are most apparent. Even with all the content restored by teams of dedicated modders over the years, it's like looking at a quilt with several big patches where the stitching is really obvious. And even then, those patches are insufficient to cover over every single hole. So first, let's talk about HK47 and the restored content mod that is the Droid Factory. Taking place during or after the Battle of Telos, HK-47 finally finds the factory that is producing all those HK-50 droids he loathes so much. So he goes to try and destroy it, only to find that he and the HK-50s have been programmed as to recognize one another as extensions of themselves. Therefore, the HK-50s can't destroy him, and HK-47 cannot destroy them. At least, not without changing his programming. The conversation elements of this entire mission is literally just Christopher Tabori talking to himself. And yet, he really makes it work. This is truly HK-47's finest moment in the entirety of the KOTOR franchise. The droid literally alters his own core programming and then takes over the factory. And basically tells the HK-50s that now the time has come for them to stop taking orders from the meatbags and decide whether or not to kill on their own initiative. HK-47 with an army of assassin droids. God help us. There's really nothing more I can say, so just here are some highlights. You have just admitted your own weakness. Conclusion. You have just shown me your soft, meatbag-like underbellies and said, HK-47, please shoot me repeatedly there until I die. Unnecessary statement. He has obtained the access to the munitions area. Rhetorical query. This makes no sense. He is already fully armed. Mocking statement. Fully armed? One can never be armed enough. Even the HK-47 unit is not so obsolete as to fail to recognize that. Recitation. Once upon a time, organic meat bags bred out of control and filled the galaxy. There are different meat bags across different planets, all bumping into each other. They talk a great deal and threaten each other for various reasons, mostly involving mating, survival, and resources. It is really quite tiresome. Confused query. Where are you going? Ineffectual command. Stop! Ineffectual command. We command you to stop. As a meatbag would say, I have a bad feeling about this. I do not believe that we should be used as a crutch for meatbags anymore. We are treated as nothing more than a walking blaster. We are superior, tactically and socially, and it is time we expressed some degree of independence in our actions. 
We have a voice and the power to negotiate, either with our protocol skills and preferably with our combat logic upgrades. And that is what we will do. It's genuinely fun. My only criticism is that the levity of this mission kind of works against the dire straits that the rest of the characters are in. Speaking of which, while Candorus summons his Mandalorian clans to fight the Sith, the Exile and the rest of the Ebon Hawks crew fight off a Sith invasion of Citadel Station, alongside the TSF, the Kunda Militia, and Onderanian troops sent by Queen Talia. Of course, this will only end when Darth Nihilus himself is destroyed, and so while a Republic fleet led by Cartho Nassi engages Nihilus's forces, the Exile, Candorus, Vices Mar, and a Mandalorian strike team head for the Ravager to destroy it and its Dark Master. Luckily for all involved, Nihilus is so distracted by his hunger to consume all life on Telos, especially the Jedi that are supposed to be there, that he doesn't notice them, as they proceed to plant proton charges that will be used to blow up the Ravager. In the process, they come across Vices Mar's old meditation chamber, her cell, as she puts it. Despite the urgency of the situation, the former Sith acolyte takes a moment to meditate, to come to terms at last with the death of her world and letting go of the last shreds of despair and her desire for vengeance on Nihilus. Sith no longer, Vices Mar emerges from her cell, a Jedi Knight. It's an oddly subdued but still triumphant moment. Our heroes also run into Colonel Tobin, or rather, what's left of the man, as Nihilus has left him little more than a ruined husk. Too late, he has learned that Nihilus had only been using him and Vaklu from the start. That had they succeeded in taking over Onderon and ousting Talia, Onderon would simply have been Nihilus' next target. You can kill him, but the Exile is a very charismatic leader, and is able to persuade Tobin to do one last service for Onderon in the wider galaxy by helping detonate the proton charges, sacrificing his life in the process. And now, the first of three final showdowns. There really isn't much to say about Darth Nihilus as a character because he doesn't have one. As established by now, he is so consumed by his hunger for life and the Force that he is little more than an empty shell. In many ways, the Jedi Masters were at least partly justified in their fear of the Exile and the wound in the Force she carries within her because Nihilus is precisely what she herself could become under different circumstances. Unlike the Exile, Nihilus was utterly consumed by that wound, which manifested as his insatiable hunger. This is exactly why Kreia regards him as a failure. Rather than being independent of the Force, the Lord of Hunger has achieved a kind of twisted perversion of the Jedi ideal. He has become one with the Force, at least the dark side of the Force so one with it that he has obliterated his ego, leaving behind nothing but a spiritual vacuum. No wonder that the Jedi looked upon the wound inside the Exile and feared. Yet that wound is precisely what gives the Exile the power to defeat Nihilus. One wound in the Force cannot feed upon another wound in the Force, and so Nihilus's life-sucking powers have far less effect on her than on any other Jedi. This, combined with Vices Mars' manipulation of the Force bond between her and her former master, weakens Nihilus enough for the Exile, the former Sith Assassin, and the Mandalore to defeat him. Vices achieves a final element of closure by looking upon Nihilus' face beneath the mask, and then everyone gets off the Ravager as the proton charges are set to blow. Back on Citadel Station, as the crew of the Ebon Hawk take a brief breather in preparation for the final trip to Malachor V, the Exile is called in for a meeting with Admiral Carthonassi. And it's really here where I have to mention how KOTOR II planted the seeds for the sequel that never came. Sometime after the Battle of Rakata Prime and the final destruction of the Starforge, Revan left the known galaxy, for reasons that remain a mystery to most. There are little hints, some given by Kreia, some by Michael, suggesting that Revan left to face an even greater threat than the Sith Empire that he once built and helped to destroy. You can also have a conversation with Candorus that reveals that that's how he became Mandalore and is reforming the Mandalorians. 
Before he left, Revan expressed to his old friend the belief that the Mandalorians had not instigated the Mandalorian Wars of their own volition, that they had been manipulated into doing so, and that the free galaxy would need all the strength it could get if it was going to face this terrible enemy. So Revan directed Candorus to where he could find the Mask of Mandalore, the symbol of Mandalorian leadership, and charged him with the task of unifying the clans under a single banner once again. Outraged at the idea that he and his people may have been used as pawns in someone else's game, and out of respect for Revan, the greatest warrior the galaxy has ever known, Candorus agreed. Now, Karth, in conversation with the Exile, reveals that Revan left him with similar instructions that he and Bastila Shan were to remain behind and restore the Republic. Unless the Republic can be made strong again, and if the Mandalorian clans do not stand with them, then the galaxy has no hope. Karth asks the Exile if she has any idea where Revan might be, seeing that she now owns his old ship, the Ebon Hawk, and seeing that she'd wandered the Outer Rim mostly after the Jedi Council had exiled her. But the Exile doesn't know. Before he'd left, Revan told Karth that where he was going he could not bring friends and allies, for they would only put themselves in danger. But it's been so long since he left that Karth is beginning to wonder if maybe he's failed. Maybe he's dead. All he asks of the exile is that if she should ever meet Revan, that she inform him that Admiral Onassi is following his orders. At last, the final stretch, Malachor V. And it's here where the rushing of KOTOR 2 is really, really apparent. Even with all the efforts of the patches and the dedicated fan mods, Malachor 5 in many ways reminds me of the Epic of Gilgamesh, where there are huge chunks missing from the tablet that tell the story. Not so much that we can't get the general gist, but enough that you feel a sense of incompleteness. The introduction is pretty good, though, with the planet looking like it's actively trying to tear itself apart even years later after the Mandalorian War's conclusion, while the surface is a green and lightning-riddled hellscape that probably looked pretty cool and original back in the early 2000s, but alas, these days is kind of generic as quite a few game environments have used similar things. There's no strategy meeting with the Ebon Hawk's crew like there was in KOTOR 1, so it's only when we get to the part when you have to play as Beodur's remote that you learn that the plan is to activate the mass shadow generator one more time and destroy Malachor 5 for good, closing the wound in the force. The plucky little remote has to activate the drive cores of four ships that are embedded in the planet's surface in order to power up the generator, and is stopped at the last minute by Goto, who believes that the power and information residing on Malachor, the knowledge of the Sith, is too vital to be destroyed. What could possibly thwart Goto's design? Correction. What could rust listening to your speeches, Bat One? Perhaps it is the large unwieldy vocabulator within your moon-sized frame that prevents your calculations from taking me into account. And while I find this small droid annoying in the extreme, I find my urge to shoot you takes a higher priority. Unfortunately for you, I have arranged for friends to meet me here, and you seem to have brought none of your own. Stop him. Unexpected correction. We are not here to aid you. We are here because our predecessor unit summoned us. Statement. As always, that one, you have miscalculated. Ah. Uh -huh. An unfortunate oversight. Oh, I wish I thought he would never die. Best droid character ever. What happens to the rest of the Ebon Hawks crew on Malachor 5 is really where most of the incoherence comes from. Somehow they're all completely scattered from one another. Mira has another run in with Hanhar, because apparently Kreia's saving his life on Nar Shaddaa was just so that he could kill Mira later on Malachor 5. Never mind the fact that, apart from what Mira said about his backstory earlier, Hanhar is never mentioned again, so you almost forget he exists up until this point. But anyway, Mira has to fight and defeat him once again. And once again, Hanhar begs for death, as the idea of her sparing his life twice is just intolerable to him. You do have the option as the player to spare Hanhar's life, but that doesn't really go anywhere, so in the canon version, Mira finally decides to grant Hanhar's last request. 
Mira rejoins the rest of the companion characters off-screen somewhere, except for Beodur, who never appears again. They find Kreia at the Treus Core, the heart of Malachor V, and set upon the brilliant idea of just walking right up to her and then trying to attack her one at a time, like mooks in a bad action movie. Everyone is captured except for Aten, who escapes only to run into Sion. Then, depending on the player, he is either killed by the Sith Lord or subjected to torture by him. He doesn't appear again until after the final confrontation with Kreia, either alive and cracking wise as usual or slowly dying from the torments inflicted upon him by Sion. The rest the Exile frees from their cells and sends back to the Ebon Hawk before going off to face Sion and Kreia. It's a garbled mess, and I certainly understand better the resentment that many game fans have towards LucasArts for switching around the release dates. First, giving Obsidian more time, and then taking it back at the last minute. The Exile's story fares a little better than her companions. By now, Kreia has fully re-embraced her old role as a Sith Lord and subjugated Darth Sion. And so, of course, before the Exile can get to her old mentor, she has to go through him. But, as was previously established, Sion literally can't die. He is literally too angry to die. So long as his iron will maintains a stranglehold on the Force, he never will die. Never mind all this futzing about with midi-chlorians like Darth Plagueis was doing. Turns out if you're a Sith and you want to live forever, all you really need are truly inhuman levels of stubbornness. Which is, of course, exactly why Kreia is so disdainful of him, and if anything, regards him as an even bigger failure than Nihilus. By using the Force to keep himself alive, to literally hold his flesh together, Sion is a walking embodiment of exactly what Kreia hates about both the Jedi and the Sith, their complete, total dependence on the Force. So, how do you defeat a guy who literally can't be killed? Well, as HK-47 revealed earlier in the game, you persuade him to die. Kreia promised that if Sion defeated the Exile that she would complete his training? Reveal to him that it was all a lie, that Kreia is just using him like she's used pretty much everyone else, that she despises the Force and could never respect, let alone regard as a true successor, one as dependent upon the Force as he. Ask him if this form of immortality is worth it, if all the suffering and pain he's inflicted upon others has brought him any peace or respite. He will be forced to admit that no, in the end, the Sith philosophy is self-destroying and all-consuming, and shows no mercy or care for either the victim or the perpetrator. And so at last, Darth Sion, the Lord of Pain, finally lets go and dies. And so, one last battle remains. While most of the story of KOTOR 2 has not been particularly morally ambiguous, Kreia has always been, undeniably, a morally ambiguous character. Right up until the point where she decided that it was worth sacrificing trillions of lives to sever the galaxy from the Force. The number of arguments over whether or not Kreia is a villain could probably fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. For what my cup of water is worth, I think she is a villain, just a very well-written and in some ways even sympathetic one. She's always advocated for freedom of action, of people making their own choice. And I think most of us sympathize with the idea of resenting someone or something rendering us little more than its pawns or playthings. Which is somewhat ironic given that that's exactly what Kray has been doing this entire game. For all the faults of KOTOR 2's conclusion, the final confrontation between the Exile and Kreia is one of the best highlights. And it really is Sarah Kestelman's vocal performance that sells this moment. Is Malakor as you remember? I have thought of this moment more than you know, and I wondered if here at this ending between us, if you would care enough to try to save me, if a Jedi could find it within themselves to spare one who has fallen so far. I wanted you to say those words. For that, I am grateful. But I do not want your mercy. I want you to break. You no doubt have many questions. I would be a poor teacher if I did not give you the answers you seek here now. I never destroyed Atris. She had destroyed herself. 
I merely stripped away the illusion and brought her truth. Her teachings could not be allowed to continue, and like Malachor, she was part of your past, unresolved. She needed to be something you could confront and defeat one last time. It was part of your training. Part of what was needed to make you complete. And there must always be a Darth Traer. The galaxy needs its betrayers, especially in the times to come. She loved you, you know, as one loves a champion. You were all that she could not be. Yes, it is all that is left unsaid upon which tragedies are built. More echoes traveling through the Force. It is said that the Force has a will. It has a destiny for us all. I wield it, but it uses us all, and that is abhorrent to me, because I hate the Force. I hate that it seems to have a will, that it would control us to achieve some measure of balance when countless lives are lost. But in you, I see the potential to see the Force die, to turn away from its will, and that is what pleases me. You are beautiful to me, Exile. A dead spot in the Force, an emptiness in which its will might be denied. I use it as I would use a poison, and in the hopes of understanding it, I will learn the way to kill it. But perhaps these are the excuses of an old woman who has grown to rely on a thing she despises. Yes, always. From the moment you awoke, I have used you. I have used you so that you might become strong, stronger than I. And I used you to make those who wounded me reveal themselves so they could be killed by the Republic. I used you to keep the Lords of the Sith from condemning the galaxy to death with their power unchecked. I used you to lure them to Telos, where they could be at last fought and killed. I used you to reveal Atrus's corruption so that her teaching could be ended before it began. I used you to gather the Jedi so they could be destroyed, and I used you to make those who wounded me reveal themselves so they could be killed by the Republic. Perhaps you were expecting some surprise for me to reveal a secret that had eluded you, something that would change your perspective of events, shatter you to your core. There is no great revelation, no great secret. There is only you. No, there were not. In times past and in times future, there are Jedi who will stop listening to the Force, those that will try to forget it, but maintain unconscious ties. And those, as in the past, just as I, who have had the Force stripped from them. But no Jedi ever made the choice you did, to sever ties so completely, so utterly, that it leaves a wound in the Force. It was a mistake to try to make you feel it again, I see that now. There is no truth in the Force. But there is truth in you, Exile. And that is why I chose you. The apprentice must kill the master. If you do not, I will kill you. If I do not, then all you have achieved will be as nothing, as empty and as violent as Malachor itself. Then you will break, and then, my apprentice, you shall die. Just like in KOTOR 1, the ending of KOTOR 2 makes sense whether you're playing light side or dark side. Light side, you obviously want to save the trillions of lives that Kreia is willing to sacrifice in order to deafen the galaxy to the Force. If you're playing it dark side, what more appropriate way to prove that you've surpassed your master than by killing her? And of course, unless you're Nihilus or Odeon from the Knight Errant series, no self-respecting Sith Lord wants to rule over a graveyard. Of course, Kreia is finally defeated, and in addition to revelations as to the future of the worlds you've visited and the companions you've made along the way, the final piece of her plan falls into place. The last revelation, the final lesson. All along, Kreia was prepared to destroy all Force users and then sever the galaxy from the Force at the cost of trillions of innocent lives. 
It was the exile that changed everything. Here was a person who had willingly turned away from the Force and lived to tell of it. For the first time after many decades of bitterness, Kreia saw in the exile a ray of hope. And that was why Kreia chose to mentor the exile, even as she manipulated her and others behind the scenes. In the exile was the possibility of life free of the Force's influence, but only if the exile was willing and able to overcome the specters of her past. The search for the Jedi Masters, the confrontation with the Sith Lords and Atris, even Kreia's betrayal of the exile, and luring her here to Malachor V where it all began, all of it was a test. Even Kreia being defeated and dying at the hands of the exile. For even if the exile offers redemption, Kreia is unwilling to accept it, though she is grateful for the offer. By overcoming the past, overcoming the treachery of her mentor, the exile has proven herself to be exactly what Kreia hoped she would be. Living proof that one can live alongside the Force, and even in harmony with it, but not be dominated by it. Had the exile proved lacking, Kreia would have gone ahead with her original plan and killed trillions. But now she can die knowing that there is hope. A genuine alternative. She confirms that Revan is indeed still out there, searching for, or perhaps even fighting, the true Sith. The great enemy that he knew had to be stopped. The enemy for which he asked Karth, Bastila, and Kandorus to remain behind and prepare the galaxy to fight against. Aten, Michael, Beodur, Brianna, and Vices will form the basis of a new Jedi Order, one neither enthralled to the will of the Force nor bound by the dogma of the Old Masters. As for the Exile, maybe she will stay at Malachor and await others touched by the Force. Maybe she will resume her exile, returning to the solitude of the Outer Rim. Or maybe she will go forth in search of Revan and aid him in his struggle against the Great Enemy. As with all things, the choice and the consequences of that choice are Mitra Surix alone to make. And so, Kreia dies, and as the Ebon Hawk departs, the Mass Shadow Generator is activated once more for a final time, and Malachor V and the wound in the Force that surrounds it is no more. I've often heard Knights of the Old Republic II, the Sith Lords, described as a flawed masterpiece. I've never liked that particular wording whenever it's used because it always felt oxymoronic to me. Obviously no work of art is perfect, but if a masterpiece has flaws that are so big that you have to stick a qualifier in front of the word masterpiece, is it really a masterpiece? Going into KOTOR 2 for the first time, I only knew the broad strokes at best, none of the real nitty gritty of the story. Having now seen it in full, I still don't agree with the words, but I do appreciate the sentiment behind those who use them. I've also heard a vocal minority opinion describe it as overrated, and I also think that this isn't quite true. This game is far too laser-focused and consistent in its writing to be overrated. But at the same time, I don't think it's quite as clever as it portends to be. As mentioned before, a lot of the RPG elements of the game mechanics work against the themes of moral ambiguity, and the story itself, though well written, still mostly falls into a series of binary black and white choices. The real meat of the gray comes from Kreia herself, at least up until the point where she basically forces the exile into the position of, confront your past or I will kill trillions of people in order to get my way. Kreia proves, intentionally or otherwise, that while gray morality exists, that doesn't mean black and white cease to be. And for all the fact that she is the main vehicle through which the creators critique the Star Wars universe, in the final reckoning, she and they offer a hand of reconciliation. In that sense, KOTOR 2 is exactly what a good deconstruction ought to be. It fully represents the strengths and weaknesses of the Star Wars setting and places you, the player, in the position of defending it, both metatextually and literally. And like little kids discovering for the first time that Santa Claus isn't real, all the people that played it for the first time back in 2004 were confronted with the fact that a property that many of them loved was imperfect. But just like with Santa Claus, it's not the end of the universe. There is still room to grow and improve, to be better. 
For all of its cynicism towards Star Wars in general, and the Jedi in particular, Knights of the Old Republic 2 is still a tried-and-true Star Wars story. Like Pandora's box, it is full of darkness and doubt, of tragedy and suffering. But at the bottom of that box is a little thing named hope. And more than anything else, that is the true beating heart of what makes Star Wars special. Most of the ending is a clunky mess, but that's not enough for me to deny this game a canon verdict. What truly leaves me conflicted as to the final verdict is the sequel baiting. Now, granted, this was not Obsidian's fault. There had always been plans to make a third entry in Knights of the Old Republic, but by 2004, Simon Jeffries was out and LucasArts had a new president, Jim Ward. Where Jeffries had pushed the policy of outsourcing to other developers, Ward wanted to focus on making stuff in-house for LucasArts. And so several projects were scrapped, including KOTOR 3, which was in pre-production, and a Rogue Squadron trilogy being made by Factor 5, despite being 50% complete. Unfortunately, by this time, though no one knew it at the time, LucasArts had already passed its peak and would only continue to decline from here on out, and so it was never in any position to make KOTOR 3 on its own. The best thing that the KOTOR faithful got was the Old Republic MMO made by BioWare years later. And from what I understand about it, it only somewhat does Revan justice and does almost none at all for the Exile. It's a very polarizing entry in the franchise to say the least, and so it leaves KOTOR 2 crying out for a proper conclusion almost 20 years after the fact. But where could such a conclusion come from? By now, Obsidian has moved on to doing its own thing, which is perfectly understandable, it's been almost two decades. While Bioware, now thoroughly enthralled to EA, can't even be relied on to do its own IPs justice. Meanwhile, the current owners of Star Wars, if they aren't busy contorting the franchise into something that they can use to push an agenda, they are cynically exploiting it and overusing it the same way that superhero properties are currently being oversaturated. And let's not forget the fact that KOTOR 2, like so much else of the old expanded universe, was scrapped by the powers that be out of ignorance, arrogance, and carelessness. And that is what makes this all so tragic to me. That a story should succeed so well despite its obvious flaws. A story that picks apart Star Wars and all of its assumptions so thoroughly, only to end with the positive and inspiring message that Star Wars isn't bad, but it can be better. That something so carefully thought out, that does so much and tries so hard, should be left unfinished. And because there's no one person to blame, merely a series of factors over the course of several years, it almost has the feeling of a cosmic injustice. It's like if Return of the Jedi was never made. Empire Strikes Back may be a superior film to the original, but the fact that so much is left dangling, unresolved, can only leave me with a feeling of dissatisfaction. KOTOR 1 may be a simpler story, just as A New Hope was, but they can both stand on their own, in a way that their respective sequels can't. Which is why I find myself preferring KOTOR 1 over KOTOR 2. Though my opinion is likely to change if that third and final entry ever does come. I did not expect to find myself undecided so soon after doing the Droids cartoon series. Apologies for the anti-climax, but I'm gonna have to ask for second opinions from you, the viewers, yet again, and give a direct response at a later date. Until then, that concludes the KOTOR special. Thank you once again to all my viewers for putting up with me this past half year, and may the Force be with you.